Cette vidéo est en partenariat avec Instant Gaming qui met à votre disposition un lien d'affiliation dans la description de la vidéo. Grâce à ce lien, vous allez pouvoir soutenir Rockstar Mag, Naughty Dog Mag, mais également mes projets perso avec mon association NSTG et même mes projets sur ma chaîne perso Chris Clippel. Grâce au lien d'affiliation, vous allez pouvoir acheter vos jeux mais aussi vos cartes prépayées sur PC, PlayStation, Xbox et même Nintendo Switch et tout cela moins cher. En plus d'économiser de l'argent, une partie de votre achat est reversée à Rockstar Mag, Naughty Dog Mag et l'asso NSTG. Ainsi, cela ne vous coûte pas plus cher à vous, bien au contraire, vous économisez de l'argent et en plus de cela, vous soutenez nos projets comme les documentaires Welcome to Los Santos ou Welcome to Liberty City, mais également les projets Naughty Dog Mag et les projets caritatifs de l'assaut comme le Grand Tour NSTG. Tous les achats que vous effectuez avec le lien d'affiliation dans la description de la vidéo permettront de soutenir l'ensemble de nos projets. Alors merci à vous par avance et bonne vidéo Hi, I'm Neil Druckmann, and I was the director and co-writer. Hi, my name is Hallie Gross, and I was the co-writer and narrative lead. I'm Ashley Johnson, and I play Ellie. Hi, I'm Troy Baker, and I play Joel. This whole theme came about because we were trying to figure out how do we recap the previous game just enough for people that haven't played it, or might have been so many years they don't even remember it. So we thought, oh, Joel could confess to Tommy. And this was... I don't know why I, I dug my heels in and I was like, I do not agree with this. And I had such a problem with it because I felt like this was a secret that Joel was going to take to his grave and he would just bear this sin. And it wasn't until we were on set and I'm sitting across from Jeffrey and I'm watching him just listen to Joel. And every take, we went deeper and got better and more truth came out. It's really small, but you're right, it's, it's really powerful and intimate of this exchange between these brothers of just how far they've come since he's rejoined Jackson. Yeah. It's become one of my favorite scenes. The meticulousness of this task of fixing up a guitar. And I remember you saying specifically, is like, you're really trying to get the grime out. And to me, how that mapped to what he's trying to do in this scene with this conversation is I'm just trying to get every last bit of dirt out. In the original game, we didn't cut to a close-up of, of Joel and seeing, like, what was his emotional state coming into that operating room. That look from Tommy. Qu'est-ce que t'as foutu? I love this right here. I saved her. And we wanted some darkness around that, that statement of, like, the implication is I did whatever I needed to do to get her out of there. And the justification you know, that comes from that. That is the central question, right? And I think that opening the game on that line is so important because Joel really does believe he saved her. And that's the question for Ellie throughout the game of, did he? I remember just so much work we did on this soundscape right here of just leaving you with that, that kind of uncomfortable feeling of um, it was a good thing, but there was definitely a lot of darkness around it. It's a great scene for Tommy as well. And now he's just now he has to carry the weight right. of this thing that his brother did. Right now he's he's not feeling great about it. Okay, oh, that's a lot. He's also a family guy, so he on some level he gets it. And he gets what obviously he knows what Joel has been through and why that decision was so important for him. There's something to me that hits me every time when Ellie rolls over. Mm -hmm. I don't think I caught it as much. I think I was aware of it. Like, Neil, you being a parent, you're more familiar with some of those gestures than I was, or I am now. Traveler will do this, where he will, when I put him to bed or whatever, and he's ready to go to sleep, or he needs to be alone with his own thoughts, he'll, he'll do that turn. And it never really hit me that that's what Ellie is doing, is, is just, okay, I'm, I'm done talking about this now. I just kind of want to be private in my own thoughts. 
Which is also an interesting juxtaposition that's happening here is we're getting to see the moment he was lying to her while he's confessing the truth to his brother mm. and the differences in those two relationships now. And it's um, despite how much they've been through and how much Ellie has become an equal of sorts, he still sees her as his child. And if he has to lie to her to protect her, he will. It was important to get this final handoff of um, playing as Joel one last time as this beautiful sunset ride towards Jackson before we fully kind of hand off the baton to Ellie. We worked so hard on these transitions to go from cutscene to gameplay, and it was just a change in tech that we had from the first game to the second game, where the first game, all the cinematics were pre-rendered. Now that they were real time, there was a lot of effort put into just these seamless transitions in and out of gameplay. Et pour ce que tu m'as dit tout à l'heure. This is a great moment. <laughs> and you have to wonder, is, like, is Tommy telling the truth? Or does he know it's too late to do anything about it? And that's the best truth to put out there. There's also something, just as a, I'm just, it, it's just occurring to me now, but I think confessing to Tommy really f speaks to sort of the themes of the game of how hard it is to be alone and to carry things alone. Mm. And even Joel can't do it at a certain point and needs to unload on Tommy. And so what it is for Ellie to isolate further and further and further and carry her secrets alone more and more and more. There's her little house. Hmm. I discovered some people don't realize that her house is the... The garage. Uh, the, yeah, exterior garage of Joel's house. Look, she's drawing a deer. <laughs> Oh, and you're hearing Sean yeah. James' song, okay. which was the yeah. song we did for the teaser trailer. Eddie? Shout out to the environment team that had to build several different versions of this room as Ellie has lived in it for longer and longer and got more and more of her items from the old world that she's obsessed with. Love a lamp. I love this moment of just like, uh, hey, how do you... <laughs> Do you both remember when we uh, did this scene live on stage yeah. just for an audience of 100, 200 people? Yes. I forget exactly. Like Jeff Keighley set up this one night live. And um, I wrote the scene just for that. But in the back of my mind, I knew already this would be the opening for the second game. Oh, yeah. And that was... Some of that was streamed except for this scene. That right. was just that, that for one, the audience. That, yeah, we did not stream the scene. There was this, I remember we got it, and then as often happens, there's a team of people that kind of come up to you, and after you go, cut, you know, best that one, that's the, that's the take we can go with, and people just kind of clouded around you, and there was a conversation that was happening. We were trying to figure out what it was, and you were, I saw you do your, you know, everything's okay, it's okay, it's fine, it's fine. And then afterwards you tell me this story that in Uncharted 3, the ship capsizing was one of the most resource-draining, almost game-breaking things that you guys had, one of the most ambitious set pieces you'd ever done. And then in the Left Behind DLC, the photo booth was one of the most mm -hmm. resource-draining, almost game-breaking things. He goes, up until... You decided to put your thumb <laughs> in your <laughs> belt loop. <laughs> oh, that's yes. right. <laughs> yeah, so actually, that, that's funny because, yeah, because you did that, um, Joel initially didn't have his shirt tucked in. Um, but in order to honor, again, this little gesture that you did, redesigned his clothing. And, and the way we did clothing on this game is we actually sourced the actual material and um, scanned it. So we had to, like, source the shirt, the pants, the belt, scan it, so we could do this one gesture that you did, which was like looping your thumb around your belt. Uh, 
writing standpoint, this was a, a, a tricky scene because we have to establish, reestablish these characters and their relationship, but also show there's something hanging over them. That there is, uh, we had to honor the ending of the first game, that, that moment of okay, of lie, that again, Ellie, Ellie knows something is off, but she doesn't quite know how to deal with it or how to move past it. Right, so this scene has like, you see the beginning, she's trying to get rid of him, and then he wins her over by playing the song, and like she softens by the end of it. And it's interesting, they, they talk about of like, you promised you would teach me how to play the guitar, and they're talking about like promises and oaths and the idea of um, keeping your promises, and we know this lie is hanging over them. I love this opportunity this song gives Ellie to watch him. Yeah. Without confrontation. And again, there's so much beautiful acting that you're doing here, Ashley. I know at least compliments are making you uncomfortable, but um, <laughs> it's like, look how much she's processing. Yeah. You could see it. You could yeah. feel it. And again, the, uh, talking about when characters make eye contact versus not, it's like only when he finishes does he finally allow himself to look up. Barely. <laughs> Barely <laughs> right there. <laughs> it's a very intimate thing. Yeah. I don't think I've ever been more nervous than I was in that scene playing that song. Were you more or less nervous when you did it live? For some reason... Playing music live to me feels a little bit more at home, um, but also I don't know if I fully understood what that song meant to you, Neil, mm. and knowing what it was going to mean now to other people once they play the game. And, and now there was context to it. Now there was story. Uh, they care about each other so much. <laughs> The lighting, lighting is so gorgeous here. Uh, and this was the same pun we had when we, when uh, you yeah. both did it live. La blague t'es revenue? And you could you could see the the shift in Joel, like th that song has just shifted the relationship a little bit. It moved yeah. the needle. Mm -hmm. He's standing up a little taller. <laughs> I love how much he's just trying to reach out to her on her terms. Yeah. Yeah. He still got that Giving in him. her space. Yeah. Still got that. Yeah. I need a daughter. And this, again, the, this writing is, is, is the same. It's like how this ended was the same as the live version where you just play the, the low E. Well, I guess with a capo, it wouldn't be an E, but... Boom, and just let this ominous note linger. Interesting parallel. In Last of Us Part One, Joel wakes up after the multi-year jump was that? To, to a knock at the door. Oh. Was that an accident? No, that was by design. Bonjour. Yeah, initially we had the whole dance and the kiss in the beginning, mm. and then once we moved it to the end, we had to kind of, through exposition and dialogue, hint at what happened. It's just Dina being Dina. Je parlais de ton engueulade avec Seth. Attends. <laughs> I love that that scene kind of plays out like an awkward thing between them as if they had kissed last night, which is really funny. Yeah. You know, it has this like kind of morning after feel, but it's like not about them, mm -hmm. which is really charming. <laughs> yeah, that's true. This is so Ashley awkwardness right here. They love it. <laughs> VV awkward. But don't, don't point, don't bring attention to something that I did, please. C'était quand même pas très cool. <gasps> Jesse's the coolest guy. He Look is. at him. He's like, you he kissed this girl, and he's like, ah, I'm, I'm fine. Yeah. Pardon. Oh, Eddie. Seth. Oh, Seth. Yeah, remember, uh, this this scene was, um, I mean, so much of the story is about forgiveness and letting go of stuff and how Ellie specifically struggles with that, and this was a pretty minor example of that. 
turns out I really struggle with it because I still hate this scene. I'm like, <laughs> fuck that guy. So he's I know, trying. me too. Look at him. He's <laughs> doesn't work. Steak sandwich. He's trying so hard. Did no, he wrapped it with a bow. The way he starts with like, Aww. look. I'm like, yo, look you. Yeah, don't, 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 don't looky hear me. Let's, let's just, oh, oh, now it's her fault. Great job. Yeah, I, this scene makes me so mad. <laughs> hey, I'm trying to apologize, you little bitch. <laughs> what? She prepared the sandwich. Okay. À la viande. Merci, Seth. Didn't we discuss cutting baguette sandwich because people had such a hard time understanding it at first? Yeah. They kept hearing bacon sandwich. Bacon sandwich. Yeah. Bigot sandwich was that? Bigot sandwich? Yeah. Je te remercie. C'est quoi ça? Sandwich de fin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I forgot about that. Hallie, you wrote that, didn't you? I I don't know. It just bigot sandwich feels, feels it does v feel Hallie very Hallie to me. Okay. Oh, oh this is uh, Dina's big intro. Oh, here ah! she comes. I'm Shannon Woodward. I play Dina. I had a really hard time hiding behind nothing here. Well, that's the thing that's so hard about sometimes <laughs> acting in these things is that you ha like the kids weren't there, and then we like yeah. later capture kids and kind of constructed all the pieces. Salut, salut. This is a V me lean. I love to lean. Je voulais juste m'excuser d'être partie hier soir. I actually really love this scene. Je comprends très bien. I love the one-liners that you guys kind of riffed on when we were doing the combat stuff for the snowball fight. Oh, my God. I still die yeah. laughing when I hear you guys insulting children. <laughs> and I think that was really, a lot of that was just my instinct. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. <laughs> Your parents don't love you. Yes. Yeah. And then I think, I think eat snow, you eat little, snow. No, yes. I think you little shits. shits. Yeah. <laughs> Because I think you were like, eat snow, and then I said, eat snow, you little shit. I God. think it's like... <laughs> I love name-calling children. Interesting parallel is uh, Ellie doesn't want to do any of this until she gets hit with a snowball, and then it's like, let's make these motherfuckers pay, which is, again, is a really lighthearted moment of what this whole story is about. All of the horse acting was always very funny to me <laughs> because... How that works is you have somebody holding on to a rope and you're just kind of pulling it along, pulling them around. And it would always make me laugh. Fun fact the guy <laughs> in the stable there is uh, Yuri, who plays Spider Man in the Spider Man in oh. Sound <gasps> King. That's Yuri? And this was another big scene. Anytime we have a big scene like this, we can only have so many actors in the volume. So this is captured in pieces. And I remember like Troy played. One of like the people kind yeah, of like, yeah, and yeah. they were improvising, talking crap in the background. Yeah, and it's not there anymore. There was a bit where he said something kind of yeah. goading to me, and it's not there anymore. But then every take we did, I'd call him a new name <laughs> that I thought yes. was like embarrassing. I'd be like, "Listen, Chad." Wait, I actually didn't know you. There's only a certain amount of people you can have in the volume. Yeah, just because we like we start losing data after a while, so to track all the. The little balls and stuff. Like, like there's like this. It gets fuzzy. Like above eight, I think it's just like it's more expensive, and you're more likely to be error prone. So it needs more cleanup. Yep. Hi, I'm Laura Bailey, and I played Abby in The Last of Us Part Two. Ominous. And here we have the introduction of this crew, the Salt Lake City crew. There's Neil. <laughs> <laughs> Shelf insert. <laughs> and here we have Laura Bailey waking up. And this was a repeating motif from the first game of these characters that are haunted by some horrible trauma and can't sleep. The lighting is really nice here. I mean, it's really nice everywhere. We debated quite a bit of like, how much do we want to reveal for this character when you're about to play as her? 
um, versus how much we want to hold off for like the second half of the game when you get to see more of her. I remember we <laughs> they rated a lot of how much snow he should have on him because he was just outside. This is one of the audition scenes, I think. De quoi tu rêvais? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's right. It's important to know that we did not want to cast you in this role. <laughs> I've heard tell that you did not. Uh, just yeah. because you're in so many things and you're so iconic. But uh, <laughs> you are the best. Uh, and once we saw your audition, there was no turning back. What are you going to do, you know? <laughs> You painted us into a corner, Laura Bailey. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> so the first real big choice this character makes, Abby, of do we turn back or does she choose justice? She's gonna end up choosing justice, just like Ellie does later many times. Choosing obsession. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's also important to note that, um, you know, when you're acting in this, there's nothing there. You're in this blank vo white volume, and we're like, okay, it's snowing. You got to act like you're freezing. There's a town in the distance. It's, you know, so weird, though. Like, I never, when I, like, try to remember a scene or remember performing that moment, I never think of it in terms of, like, oh, right, we were in this gray volume. Mm. It's I always had, like, this visual of every set that was actually supposed to be there. <laughs> and I think of it in those terms. But I, I think that's a unique okay. skill that uh, only some actors have. Really? And other actors without the set, without the costume, they just, they can't get into it. They can't lose themselves the way like you and Troy and Ashley do. When I did this audition, Troy was reading opposite me because he was doing all of the Abby mm -hmm. auditions. And that's right. he forgot all of the lines in this particular <laughs> scene. <laughs> And we were just, just like making stuff up. I remember be thinking like, that went really well. <laughs> These scenes can be very tricky to write, but they're also a lot of fun where you're just given hints of this relationship. And obviously there's this some kind of triangle here between Abby, Owen, and Mel. And Abby does a very poor job of hiding her feelings. <laughs> But it's, it's just interesting that, um, you know, Owen, we're setting up here, he plays this moral conscience for this group. And even here, he's trying to give Abby a way out. But not at any cost. So it's like, that's, there's a line here for justice that he's not willing to cross. And she hasn't found her line yet. Well, it's also like selflessness versus selfishness, right? He now has, e even with nothing else, he now has a baby he has to think about, right? Which is the same for Dina, which is the same for Jesse, which is the same for Joel. But she is only thinking about herself. Well, one could argue she's also thinking about her father, that this is all coming out of love, the love she had for her dad and the injustice that they all experienced in his brutal m murder by Joel's hands. Oh, interesting. Tu crois qu'elle est bonne? Ça périme, la weed? Hmm. On va voir. <laughs> the infamous weed scene. We can talk about how we did this twice. Oh, oh yeah. No. Oh, we, yeah, oh, we had a God. whole other yes. version of the scene that was a little too oh, earnest. Oh, yeah. And we rewrote it and recaptured it. It's How funny do you, you mean describe by that? it as earnest? Because I felt that it was it was it was literally a fight until she's like, "Okay, I love you." It also felt that fight was trumping some stuff that happens later in a the theater mm. once we're in Seattle. Mm. So this was like a moment to give them pure innocence before we go on this violent journey. I remember Neil when you pitched the idea that like she throws the glass, and I still to this day I'm like, "But what if you smoke glass?" I'm yeah. really concerned. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> tu sais, on va rester coincé un moment. Uh, kissing scenes in performance capture is really hard. I feel like that the the hardest part about it was when we would have to do 
the ones where we would have to be standing apart. Oh, yeah. Oh, and yeah. That was really embarrassing. We would just have to be like, mm, yeah, with ourselves. Yeah, because we, we had one where it was just you standing there uh, with your face turned to the side Ugh, and I, just kind of kissing the air so we get the pure facial reference that isn't obscured by and then Shannon's was like, big head. Why do, you need, why do you need the front of the face? The front of the face is uh, being used. Well, because they animate it from like all angles, even though you only see the, like yeah. one side. I feel like if I had to do this with anybody else, it would have been even more uncomfortable. But because Shannon and I got so close, it was helpful to sort of, when we had to do those awkward sort of kissing moments and we weren't actually being able to connect with each other physically and feeling awkward and weird, we would still be holding on to each other. So it still felt... We were like minorly cuddling. She's minorly cuddling. <laughs> so you're like, well, at least there's like a little bit of something like here. Like intimacy. There was yeah. still some form of intimacy that it was like, all right, I still feel safe. I don't feel like I'm like flapping in the wind. And and you're in a brightly lit room. Very brightly lit room. With a bunch of technical engineers like yes. standing all around you. Yeah. But we found ways we found ways around it to sort of still be able to, you know, connect okay. with each other and not feel so weird. I mean, what you're doing is... I think pretty hard of you're trying to convey years of relationship with this other per- your best friend and it yeah. all has to come across like there's just so much history and yet there's a still awkward thing that hasn't been realized until this moment. C'est toi qui dis ça. Tu me donnes envie de retourner en plein blizzard. Personne flick that joint really aggressively in a second. Like Ellie's so cool here. Look at how cool she is. Yeah. The flicking always made me it's uncomfortable. I was like, what if it catches, what if it catches on, on fire? It's a very dry space. One guy that saves her life is the one guy she wants to kill. Well, I think it speaks to the nuance of atonement, right? It's like she ultimately will save two other kids in trouble. But is that enough? Does that make up for anything? So we wanted to create a scenario for them where, again, and Tommy trying to do the right thing and create some trust between him and Abby he inadvertently reveals who they are. You could see right now, right there, like Abby has this reaction that only makes sense for players in hindsight, knowing who she is. But now her goals become different, not only to escape the horde, but to get these two back to her people. This is where we see Joel doing something that, for us who have spent so much time with him before, is preternatural to him. It's to trust someone. It's really, really hard, but he's choosing to do it. And the problem with choosing to trust people is you always, every time, open yourself to getting hurt. That's just such a Laura uh, look. Yeah. Oh, I love it. <laughs> it's like, boy, this is... This is a bit of a pickle. <laughs> this is the Lethal Weapon 4 comparing scars. It's, I love it. Look at those arms. Really jacked. Dina's hot. So is Ellie. They're hot. Yeah, we're hot. Yeah, we're hot. I remember armpit hair being a large discussion. Armpit hair with uh, Ashley Swadowski, who was our character art director. Oh. Yeah, and how much body hair should the girls have? And mm. what are we okay with? And, like, let them be natural ladies. I love it. La brûlure là. Oh, je l'ai fait exprès. Pourquoi? It's on, it's, it's on the tip of her tongue right there. Uh, that's a hard thing to say to somebody. Like, oh, I'm the only person that doesn't really get affected by this thing that's completely ruined the world. Juste là. 
Now I'm trying to remember. Does it make it in that I'm like I told you something it true? It does. Yeah, it does. Yeah. This still yeah. happens. Here. Yeah. I, this her. scene because we did it twice. Some, sometimes I'm like I don't remember which <laughs> because we both times we did like it was like five hours. Yeah, they were big yeah. days. Avec des traces de dents, des kisses, ah, euh, des chiantes. Quoi euh, <rire> Moi, je t'ai raconté une histoire vraie. M mais moi aussi, c'est une histoire vraie. Tu veux que je te morde <rire> Oh God. Oh, here comes Stephen. I remember how Shannon, how angry you were at Stephen. I wasn't angry at Stephen. <laughs> I couldn't tell why I was mad, and then I. We, this was the only real thing I actually fought for was was this was to make him turn around. It was with you. And I was like, he needs to turn around, and you were like, why? And I was like, and I, it took me a while to explain it to you, and then when he did it, then you were like, I get it. Because I was like, no, because I have to protect her. Pretty sure that was in the script. No, it wasn't. Right. It was the only <laughs> argument we had. It's been three years. I don't remember. Oh, You're yeah. probably it was right. Actually, I remember this. It was the only was thing I argued with you about. And it was because I felt so protective of Ashley that I knew it was right. That I was like, because we were so close, that I was like, turn around. She's naked. Like, yes. You know, because you guys knew each other intimately, but yeah. Ellie and. Exactly. And because I had to, like, I wanted to prove to you that I was loyal to you and not embarrassed because he was there. But I love it. I feel like it shows so much about how strong Dina is and how loyal and sort of just, uh, I don't know, I love that. I feel like that little moment says so much about Dina. We really wanted to show or build trust between Joel and Tommy and this group to show that Without their help, they might have died. Meaning Tommy and Joel would have died without this group. There's another one. Where I think I'm like screaming out to all like the actors. Okay, now they're burning. Now like there's a lot of fire. <laughs> and you got to speak up over the storm. Again, none of those elements are there. And right now, only Abby knows what's about to go down. Everybody else thinks like, oh, we just found friendly people that helped us along. We captured this all as one go from yeah. here all the way to the golf club hit. And um, initially we had versions of it where it was edited to be multiple cuts. And then it felt like it could just be way more tense if the whole thing was one shot. It um, required a lot of stitching of different performances and different elements and some tweaking of stuff in animation. But um, yeah, I find that this scene has so much tension that the way it, it now moves. We rehearsed it so many times before we shot it to make all the moving parts work. From a directing side, that this can be hard as well because you're trying to pay attention to so many actors and making sure it's all feeling honest and authentic. You should come with us and make the plan before departing. It's sympa. Again, there's, there's no ambush here. They're all being authentic until this moment. And now everything has changed. We knew this was going to be the most controversial scene in the whole game and that and the intention is that it is brutal and it is hard to watch, which obviously as a player is really difficult to go through, but it puts you in alignment with Ellie. You're watching this devastation to this man that you've come to love as a character, and now you're watching him be brutally murdered. And it should be upsetting, it should hurt. A lot of people are still really upset about it, but what a faster way, it, like, I can't think of a faster way to help you understand why Ellie is gonna go as far as she's gonna go, because we're there seeing how this thing was stolen from her. Yeah, this interplay of like, you want him to suffer and he's not giving you the satisfaction of like, I don't care who you are, do your worst. Mm -hmm. And you try. Yeah. You try to do your worst. 
Joel's not a man who begs. This is a conversation I had with Troy about how prepared he was. He, like he, like he's lived for 20 years, 25 years at this point of like, just always accepting that this day might come. Something like this will happen because it always happens in this world. Yeah, it's irrelevant to him who they are or why they're doing this because there are so many people who could want to do this to him given the life he's led. I just remember shooting it and being like, this moment you've worked towards for so long and wanting it to feel right and wanting it to feel good. And it happens and you just feel fucking empty. Mm. Mm -hmm. I think we've talked about it, Neil. Like you had talked to me about this role and you told me about this character, Abby, and you told me what you were planning for her. And she had like a different story, I think, at the time, Mm -hmm. um, how they met and everything. But I was excited and terrified because, like, as a player, that's traumatizing. And I didn't know how people were going to react to it. Um, Yeah, we had versions of the sequence where Ellie came in after the fact. And it just felt we needed her to see it to really set up this journey. Yeah, this was rough. This was a rough day on set because I knew we were losing a character that we all love very deeply. You know, even the imaginary circumstances of that are just hard. It's also our, you know, all of our friendship, my friendship with Troy. So just seeing that and... (sighs) What I remember more than anything is, um, you know, we're going through the mechanics of it, and we're stupid suits on a sound stage, and there's all of these machinations and, and things that are keeping it goofy. But the one thing that cuts through the din of all that is when... when I look over at Ashley. Um, because being the great actor that you are, um, all of those things go away, and all you see is the moment that we're trying to create and the reality of what this scene is for you personally. And everything that I'm feeling, everything that I'm thinking is gone because I'm just watching. And I don't know if I'll ever be able to watch that scene without it bringing me to that place, ever. Um, But the thing that I, has been proven to me is because of the way that I feel, because it's so hard, it is absolutely the most honest, perfect version of this story. There's no other version of this story. There just isn't. And for for this version of the scene, it was important that we were in Ellie's head, that you don't get to hear this conversation that's happening around her, but this was just about the ringing of the ears of pure hatred and anger that she's experiencing right now. Just this, this final look right here where she sees him and he can't fix this. Well, she's going to try to find a way to fix it. Yeah, she's going to try to find a way to fix it in the best way she knows how. scene with you and Jeffrey brings you Tupperware with food oh yes I this was one of this was one of my favorite scenes to shoot I love working with Jeffrey you're so brilliant how it goes from this really sad mournful place to just slowly rage over time as you're not getting what you want also this emptiness you have for just from that look out at the window there to like this that like bereft it, it's just really it's just really right on point. It's so good. Salut. Salut. Jeffrey here is, is quite brilliant. It's like yeah. he uh. has to, he wants to go after the people that hurt Joel. So there's like the emotional part of his mind and the, the rational part. And they're kind of in conflict here. And like he's trying to do what's best for Ellie, which is to say it's not worth it. I also really love how the blocking of this scene worked out because I love that neither of them can look at each other. They're not facing each other. 
I have that you must get a good shot. Oh, and Jeffrey's voice. It's so scrumptious. <laughs> si on veut faire les choses comme il faut, on aura besoin de renfort. Et Jackson se retrouvera sans protection. I love it. It's like the, the one time you look at him is to make him feel shame. Like, are you really saying this to me? The only time that there's confidence there with her is when there's anger present. Et si d'autres chasseurs nous attaquent? C'est toi qui dis ça ou c'est elle? Elle a pas vraiment tort. Si ça avait été toi ou moi, Joel serait en route pour Seattle depuis longtemps. Which is true. Well, we had actually lines here where he counters that, and he <laughs> says, Joel never went after the people that killed his daughter. Like, because we, we, we really wanted to flesh out the point that, like, Joel is more pragmatic with his violence, where Ellie is, comes from a much more emotional place with it. Why didn't you guys keep that in? It just felt like we we're just too, on the too, much, too much exposition about the previous game. We wanted more to stay in this moment. Like, there's other ways of to talk about what Joel did in other spots and really wanted to focus about this, the logistics of going after the people, going after Abby. I don't care. Again, this, this moment of decision where he's like, in order to protect her, I'm going to have to go by myself. And he's like, now he's lying again. Not dissimilar to Joel lying to Ellie to protect her. Right, that gave me a day's bullshit. Okay. Why the choice of the hair piece coming down? The little hair string for, for Tommy? There's a little bit of design, like Abby has something similar as well. So it's like there's um, what animators call secondary movement. So as when he's moving around, he does like physics on the hair. I just you know, one more way to bring the CG character to life. Yeah, it's also such a flex because it d really so doesn't hard. look good in other games. <laughs> like it's yeah. just like it looks amazing, and it's like it's it feels it's just like such a subtle flex. Like look what we can do. <laughs> yeah, I love this this hug that then it's just too painful for the two of them. They can't stay in that moment. Uh -uh. That's uh, too uncomfortable to be vulnerable. Got too much shit to do. There's, there's something about, you know, when, when um, it doesn't feel real until you're at his grave. Like, there's a part of you, maybe because you play a bunch, like, you play video games, you watch a lot of popular movies, you keep thinking he's going to come back somehow. And then it's like, no, there's his name on that gravestone. And then the famous Gustavo All Gone, another version of that theme. It was hard. It was hard. Joel is a character that I love. And I, I wasn't ready to let him go. So seeing that, even experiencing that of seeing, you know, oh, we're doing a scene where we're at the gravestone is very final. I love it. I love that Dina was there the whole time and we didn't know that yet. Not looking on, just sort of giving Ellie her moment. I remember when we were doing that, I really did feel like I was like really trying not to listen to you. I felt that too. You did? For, yeah. It's like, I'm right here if you need me, but it's I'm like, not but listening. But I'm not listening, you know, you, you have your privacy, but if you need me, I'm here. This is uh, Ashley Scott as Maria realizing what Tommy has done. Maria. Je pars pour Seattle. J'ai essayé d'oublier, mais j'y arrive pas. Ces gens paieront pour ce qu'ils ont fait. Ellie va essayer de me suivre, mais tu dois l'arrêter. Prends-lui ses armes, enferme les chevaux, elle aussi s'il le faut. Fais-moi gagner du temps pour régler ça. Ton mari qui t'aime, Tommy. 
Cette mission, c'est du suicide. Il aurait dû m'emmener avec lui. I like that she hasn't thought at all about what she, she's just going. She doesn't even know what she's no, doing, what she's no, gathering. Zero plan. And, and Maria knows this, right? Maria knows her, like a parent of sorts, and to say, okay, well, if you're going to do this, here's some stuff. Damn right she is. <laughs> Ride or die. I love that those little moments with Dina where you see the snarky mm -hmm. bits. And it's funny because, like, this whole section here, I constantly felt like any time we were dealing with Joel or anything about Jack's in there, I was like, oh, this is none of my business. Mm -hmm. You know, like, it felt like I shouldn't be there. Like, I, And even in that scene there, too, it was like, well, I mean, yeah, I'm going with her and I'm here to be with her, but all of this stuff predates me. So all I could do were kind of these little things that were almost, like, for your benefit to, like, kind of support you or be like, I saw that. That was a lot. Are you You're okay? Like, oh, boy. You know? <laughs> She's a lot. Yeah. It's a weird feeling of um, letting someone that's grieving have their space, but offering yourself to help them in any way you can. Très bien. Alors partez. Pendant qu'il fait jour. I really remember the end of this scene and this look that I give you. Like, well, that was a lot. <laughs> I think, yeah, here it is, right here. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> I was like, well, like, like, oof, this is like a lot. Today also is a that, lot. Also, that could have gone way worse. <laughs> yeah, and, and, yeah, in here it's still there. I'm like, all right. This this shot right go. here with the light coming through Ellie's ear is just so gorgeous. Ali, do you want to talk about how we managed to get oh, the right sure. to this beautiful song? Sure. We were looking for a song, and my my bestie is a spectacular woman named Lauren Savoy, whose husband is uh, Paul Wachtar Savoy, who is um, a member of the band AHA. And so I reached out and, and said, would it be possible to get this dope-ass song in the game and they were like, yeah, let's do it. That's amazing. That's great. So it just like, it was just a lucky happenstance that we were able to, to pull it off. And it's great. Cause now every time now, like two of my favorite things are combined forever. It's also cool how these things are such collaborations where this, that's obviously Ashley singing, but that's Ashley's friend Chris playing guitar and we mo his hand and then transpose that onto Ellie's body. I loved this game mechanic. So fun. This is my favorite missable moment in the whole game. The fact that this is optional, well, I think. Remember is... how much we talked about the, yeah. the fact because like so yeah. many people love this, and we're like, oh. and then there were people on the team that argue that you, that you should not be able to miss this, but it makes it more special knowing that you might have missed it. You got to earn yeah. me staring at you <laughs> <laughs> for several minutes. <laughs> it's such a good cover too. I mean, I wouldn't say it to Ashley's face. Don't look over here, but like, <laughs> it's pretty solid. to say I'm odds and ends. When I see uh, Dina's 
looks over here, my interpretation is that she's remember all the times that she was falling in love for Ellie in the past when she was with Jesse. Because um, right there talking about this has happened before and she played this song. And the other character moment that's interesting here is like the, the song she originally play here when she picks up the guitar is Future Days, is what Joel teaches her. And as soon as Dina walks through the door, she stops playing that song because she doesn't want to talk about that. This is actually, I think, canonically the first time you will have seen Ellie successfully play guitar since the opening scene where Joel says he's going to teach her. Yeah. So this is the first moment that we realize, like, that he really did teach her. So it also represents not just, like, her relationship with Dina, but... Oh, it's a, you're right. It's every time she's picking up a guitar, there's a connection yeah. to Joel every yeah. single time. And we were like, when we were making this, we kept talking about what are different ways we could remind you of Joel because he's not there. Make him a ghost. But he's present. There were versions where we talked we about having ghost like Joel. We ghost, ghost Joel, Joel like go talk to Ellie, and it just felt a little too campy for this story. J'en avais envie. Moi aussi. Allez, on se remet en route. Ouais. Oh, the oh. Tommy torture scene. Mm. So we got to see Joel do this scene in the first game of interrogating two people. And now we get to see like the aftermath of having this interrogation done by Tommy. Just shows you what he's capable of. And then later we get to see Ellie try to do this. Right, and at this point for Dina, she doesn't really know about Tommy's past. She doesn't know that he... She doesn't have the privileged information that Tommy used to be as bad as Joel, and she's just really sort of seeing yeah, that for the she, first time. Because she knows, like, the reform Tommy that lives right. in Jackson, that helps everybody. Right. Hmm. Yeah, I remember we iterated a lot on the lighting of this room and trying to give it the right vibe, that it wasn't too bright or too dark. Lui, je l'ai jamais vu. That's, that's really important. I don't recognize him. That shows Tommy killed someone that wasn't involved in Joel's mm. death. That there's already starting to be this cost of um, whether this person is innocent mm. or not, is who knows. No, he wasn't. This is the worst board game ever. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that really, like, rocks me about some of these scenes is also just how comfortable they are around death all the time. Yeah. It implies her understanding this kind of anger and grief as well, that, like, Ellie really is not okay and she's losing because other people are going through this right. all the time. And so, like, it's those little things like that that really, like, moved me when I was actually playing the game. I was like, God, this is fucked up. Like... And, and right around this area is where we have Dina mention her sister mm -hmm. and how she was never able to avenge whatever happened to her sister. Mm -hmm. So she has this unfulfilled thing, and she knows how traumatic that can be, and she doesn't want that for Ellie. He's great. Yeah. Chase, is, Chase Austin is great. And fun fact, Chase played uh, young Sam Drake in Uncharted 4. Comment tu nous as trouvé? So ballsy. <laughs> you think that's what Ellie really believes that no matter what, they're going to get what's due? Like there's like some cosmic karma thing going on? Um, I feel like she has to. Or she's just bullshitting him to make him believe that there's more people coming. So, uh, that guy is being played by Ruben Langdon, who played James in uh, part one. His face, though, is uh, the scan of Mike Hatfield, our um, lead foreground artist. On doit tuer tous les intrus. Oh, 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 attends, attends, fais pas de conneries, mec. C'est un ordre direct. Non, faut la faire parler, qu'elle nous dise ce qu'elle sait. Mais je m'en fous de ce qu'elle sait ou non. T'as vu ce qu'elle a fait aux autres Réfléchis, on a aucune idée. Ça pourrait être une embuscade, Mike. Combien ils sont On les trouvera, on les butera. Tu peux pas réfléchir par toi-même. Deux secondes. Tu peux pas. 
time Dina realizes that she's like really not okay. So she's like, what the fuck? Yeah. Yeah, which I love because... It's the hint of the obsession. Yeah. Of like she's losing herself to the, this chase instead of what's actually happening right now. And really, really to their detriment. And it was important when we were writing this scene to have the death be relatively quick. And then there's, you can't even linger and think about it. Um, and again, this, this just kind of push forward of like, maybe the next one will be more satisfying. Or maybe the one after that will be more satisfying. The first kind of like uh, draft we have of all Seattle is Sucker Punch Games made Infamous Second yes. Son, which takes place in Seattle. So they gave us a 3D model of all of Seattle wow. as a starting point. And then we just spent a lot of time just like mapping out the entire story and where like Ellie and Abby go. So we have this very intricate map of all the location. And based off of that, we said, okay, now we need a map that they could point to in the cinematic to get us to the, to the TV station at its next location. I remember one of my first meetings, or one of my early meetings at Naughty Dog was with M, and she was, who's a, a lead designer at Naughty Dog, and she had spent a lot of time figuring out how Seattle would be flooded in the future. So a lot of the actual flooding you see is is semi-accurate to how it would happen if there was that much water happening. M was the one that pitched Seattle initially. Oh, be, really? Uh, be because she, she felt that it had the most kind of unique locations that we could move through and had a lot of verticality within the city. This is the foreshadowing I'm pregnant scene. This is my least favorite part of my performance. <laughs> I'm not kidding, nauseous perform. It's very, it's, it really, every time I see it, I'm just like, mm, it's not good. Is that your Achilles heel? Is... Oh, there's a lot, hiding behind walls and um, yeah, that, no. You can hear no. the puke splashing on the ground. I did hear that, they helped me there. And, and that, again, it's another one of those things where like the audio department, let, let me listen to like several versions of puke hitting the ground and, and picking one. Ew. I always feel like whenever I have to act, like I'm throwing up, I always start dry heaving. Because mm. once you get that, then you're like. Like a cat with a furball? Yeah. Here's my big moment. <laughs> this is your big performance. <laughs> Here she is. <laughs> Do you say that because that body's much taller than Hallie? <laughs> <laughs> Everything is. Those people listening, um, Hallie's a tiny, tiny, tiny little person. I'm Such really portable. Tiny. Yeah, these but that's scenes. The these part. scenes are really hard, really hard to write, which because again we're trying to make it a character moment, but give you enough information to go forward in the clue chain towards finding who you need. And giving you yeah new information so it doesn't feel repetitive, right? We're opening right. up the world progressively with each sort of expository beat as well. There's this really nice beat at the end here where like Dina calms Ellie down and takes the pictures yeah. from her. Hmm. Des photos de... You could just, you could, it's really, it's really nuanced here what you're doing, Ashley, but there's just this like anger that's starting to bubble up as you look at this stuff and like, look at their fucking smiles. Yes. Just looking so happy. There she is. Laura Bailey. And that's the... The Last of Us 2 theme, which is like a reverse version of the Last of Us 1 theme that Gustavo created for this. 
Hey, hey, hey there, tiger. <laughs> yeah. Okay, you can tiger. see it. How you? Uh, it's yeah. Merde. Is that you, Hallie? That voice. I was just wondering that myself. Because like, it is you later. Sounds... I think that might have been you. Like... Yeah. Oh, this is yeah, the, the mask break. No, no, no. I remember just fighting. I was like, I just have to make sure her hands never touch the mask. I remember talking to you about this, Neil. Like, you were like, it's like she's, it's like she's committing suicide in front of you. Is like what it is. Oh like, yeah. It, you as know, far as you know, she is. Yeah, and so that's where that reaction came from. Was he was like, she's killing herself in front of you. Is what it looks like to you. And there it is. The, I'm immune. I'm pregnant. Scene. Yeah, it's just uh, this is where the the obsession. I think this is the first time it's really getting in between them that there's now personal conflict yeah, starting to form. Yeah. yeah, there's a real standoff towards the end of this scene too. Hallie, do you remember this was your first week at Naughty Dog and we had an outline. Mm. Some of the major beats were there and you had the idea of like, what if we made Dina pregnant? Yeah, because we were, the, the, I think it was on my first day, and the problem we were trying to solve was we want these two girls to go to Seattle together. We want to have Ellie to have this conduit to talk about her feelings and maybe this thing to pull her back, but how do we keep, how, how can we narratively hold Dina back so that Ellie can do a bunch of these missions alone because so much of this is about the singularity of the obsession and the loneliness of that and how hard it is to be alone in this world. Um, then I just threw it out there. Let's, let's knock her up. What's interesting too with, um, if you think about the first game, over the course of the journey with Joel and Ellie, is they slowly open up more to each other and reveal more of their secrets. Uh, and these characters are kind of doing the same thing. They're both holding back on secrets. So even though it's a very angry scene, they're revealing everything to each other. You were telling the truth. Yeah, bitch. I'll just speak the subtext for all these scenes. <laughs> Please do. I found this scene really hard because it was one of the, I mean, we literally, I mean, you have two very like big <laughs> reveals or reactions that were that could have been like really soapy if I did it wrong, you know. It's like the I'm pregnant and also like oh, the chemical burn, you know, like that. That's really well, tough. Well, it's and, like because like, I, I, I remember we talked a lot about that, which is um, you just you just thought your friend was going to die in front of you. You thought yeah, yeah. you might have to shoot them. Yeah, in front it really of you. opens. With so her you being have this like, moment of like yeah. sadness, relief, and also by the way, I'm pregnant. A lot of yeah. the times when Ellie's in severe conflict, she like. What I, one of the things that I find very relatable is like suddenly she loses eye contact. Like it, it just goes inward. Everything just goes into this inward rage that is so nuanced. And I don't know how you could really pull this off in a in a game a decade ago, maybe because there's so much beautiful facial that uh, that you do that they're able to capture. Yeah, I I I, I feel like I talk about this all the time. Like this game. I don't think would have had the impact or, or any of that without, I mean, there's so many people that make up the performance that you end up seeing and playing. And I feel like you can give it your all, but if you don't have the right people that are sitting there for, I don't know how, I mean, years well, it's, and years. It's, it's, um, it's sculptors, Yeah. it's animators, mm -hmm. it's lighting artists, even if you, if you don't get the right lighting, the performance doesn't come through. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and it, all that stuff just takes a lot of effort and iteration, like so much iteration to get it right and to just to, to try to, that moment we felt on the stage to draw it out in a CG character is a lot of work. Hmm. So much work to really nail the anxious avoidant attachment style. <laughs> <laughs> it's gorgeous. It's like we all understand, you know? The way she handled it, it's like, like almost like a religious artifact or something mm. that there's like it's 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 like a medium it's, it's like a, a connection to Joel. Yeah. Well, it is right because we tie it to every flashback. Yeah. 
Yeah, I love that the attachment to Joel is through music. Over the course of shooting this, how long did how long did it take to shoot? Just like three years. Yeah, like three years. <laughs> well, actually, we shot the trailer where you play guitar before we even made Uncharted Four, because we had started working on this game and then um, the game went on pause for two years before we picked it back up. Hey, look, Ellie's learning. Hey. One of the things I really appreciate about your performance, Ashley, is how you're able to so seamlessly jump between these different ages and different levels of innocence that mm -hmm. this character has. Mm. Thanks. <laughs> I also now watch this. I'm like, that guitar is so expensive. Why, why are you just leaving it? Right? Just leaving it out there. <laughs> I wanted to show how, like, uh, how did Ellie learn how to swim? Because that was such a big plot point in the first game. Yep. <laughs> just, it's just nice to see things were okay for a while between these two. I remember feeling, oh, this is a good, this is a good thing to be back into. Like, it's, we're jumping into summer. We're jumping into, like you said, when when things were good. <sighs> This is a, a culmination of so many things, right? So for this moment of just Ellie's love of space, of Joel wanting to make this like moment just beautiful for her, her Walkman. And this idea that Ellie sometimes can, has such a strong imagination and can go into her own head. Actually started with the comic book, the American Dreams comic book. So when she looked at the Raja's arcade, she was able to picture it with like children running around. It's like the idea that she can, she's so in love with the old world that um, she does whatever she can to kind of live in it. And that's, we got the idea to really go in her head and make you feel as if she's traveling to space. There is such a unique nervousness, anticipation, and joy um, that comes with a parent giving their kid, trying to give their kid the perfect gift. Right. And if they like it, it's the best feeling in the world. And if they don't, it's <laughs> terrible. You know, Close your eyes. And um, for people familiar with the first game, uh, the the DLC of Left Behind, there's a, a big parallel here for when Riley tells Ellie, close your eyes. Mm -hmm. And she makes her picture this arcade game. And it's like as if these two people just know Ellie so well of what would make the perfect gift for her. Minus 15 seconds, guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Uh, again, our, our lighting team did such an awesome, because there's so much that needs to be conveyed here with just lighting. And so they're animating these lights um, and then changing the reflection on the glass. There's a lot of tech here, a lot of careful crafting to get this moment. I also love that we're just with Ellie in this moment, you know? It's like you just need Gustavo to do this little riff. Mm -hmm. That's it. <laughs> and it takes it over the top. Oh, I yes. just, the scene is, is so beautiful, but so sad to me. Just because it's, because I, I know what's coming. And just seeing Joel trying so hard to reconnect and regrow this relationship with Ellie again. Um, you can see his guilt. You can feel Ellie's shame. It's like, uh, but 
Yeah, I watch it and I think it's such a beautiful scene, but there's that level underneath it. That's heartbreaking to me. <laughs> it was really important for us to have um, these happy memories um, that are obviously mixed with like some negative feelings she has about Joel and the choices that he's made. But ultimately, I, I believe she, the, the, the positive, the happy memories overwhelm the negative. Well, I think Ellie is, is so driven by her own shame and guilt, and you need to know why. And it's because there was something worth saving. There was something, there was a true loss here. And, and part of that is her own decision to emotionally protect herself by distancing herself from Joel. But it had a cost. Oh, and right. no matter how happy a sequence we have, it's just this lie and this choice that Joel made is hanging it's over these blessing. characters. As a reminder for Ellie, is like, you can't fully let this thing go. Awkward. Hattie, almost bougie. Mm. I really don't want to talk about this right now. <laughs> it's always so exciting to see because obviously when we're shooting this we're on a sound stage and i picture us being there but it's always so much better when i finally see it in the game it's always such a better version of it than i had in my mind more puking this is <laughs> you could really hear the puke splashing yeah, this, this in the... one I, I this one i feel more comfortable with Tu me trouves toujours canon là. Carry me to be um, fixing some kind of computer and, I mean, and then puking in the middle. Really proves how much uh, Ellie loves Dina because going up to someone who just puked and getting close to them, that's a lot. I mean, to be fair, yeah. she did stay up all night tracking the radio stuff. I know. But she she also puked. Like listen, if I had to date one, I think I think Dina. Oh, for sure. For sure. I would I would steer clear of the of Ellie. Peut-être que Tommy l'a chopé. Possible. Et elle? There's this moment, again, we, we don't, Ellie doesn't, just, there's a moment where she looks to Dina and then she realizes, like, how much Dina's been doing. You could see the appreciation in her face. I remember this because I felt so bad. Because the way you were just playing it, you were just so sick, but you were like, I feel like I need to pull my weight. Since I had called you a burden, and I felt like such a piece of shit. This move right here of, like, scooting in and this back rub thing is such an Ashley move. Well, it's also because we couldn't get too close, because when we'd stick together, we'd otherwise stick. she would have held me. Yeah. Yeah, and then this was again we wanted to leave Dina behind because we wanted this Ellie by herself, just these really lonely pursuits. Uh, and it was I felt like it was really it was really hard to justify how we're gonna pull it off, but I, I felt like this scene does a good job of it shows Dina tries. <laughs> like, even if she feels like shit, she wants to be there to help Ellie. In The Last of Us, there's a lot of um, totems that come to represent certain people, whether it's Joel's watch, Ellie's switchblade, the guitar that's sh shared between Ellie and Joel. And, uh, now it becomes this bracelet that Dina gives Ellie as a good luck charm. It's like this, this chamsa, which is a very Middle Eastern thing that uh, was very much in my family. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I love that she gives it to her for. Her. It will keep her safe. It's a chamsa and an evil eye within it. Ça te portera chance. 
Je crois pas en la chance. Did we ever establish how Dina got that, whether that was from her sister? I think it was from her sister, but... Yeah, that, that's what's in my mind, but I don't know if we ever explicitly say that. There's a lot of, like, foreshadowing here, too, of, like, the yeah. splitting up, mm -hmm. and then later the splitting up at the farm. scene that everybody hates us for. The great mislead. <laughs> the great mislead. Mm. Yep. I guess maybe we should talk about that. Um, when we released that first trailer for the game, a lot of people guessed that Joel was dead. And we were worried that after that point, it just, it'll be too obvious. So how can we throw them off the scent? And that's when we came up with the idea of um, swapping Joel and Jesse here, which um, I have mixed feelings about in hindsight. It got people excited about something that wasn't there and... Um, you know, our motivation was in the right place of trying to protect the story, but didn't maybe think it through of how it might upset some people. I remember when that trailer came out, then everybody I knew assumed that then it meant I was going to die. Right. And Which I, then we just leaned into with other yeah, trailers. Yeah, yeah, and everybody was, like, texting me being like, oh, it's, oh my God, you die. Like, And they were like, it's so embarrassing for you. I was like, what? Wait, oh, I, I can't say anything. And I couldn't, I was just like, lol. <laughs> LOL. Ha <laughs> ha. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, I think when the trailer came out, we were in the studio that day. We were mm. doing VO, and so we were, like, watching all the... And I was like, oh, yeah. uh oh. Uh, I also like that we get to establish, you know, we, Jesse's in charge, but we never get to see why. Mm -hmm. why. Why is this guy so good at what he does? And now we get to see it and get to experience it in gameplay. Okay. Did <sighs> Yeah, and then The Last of Us, unlike Uncharted, we don't rely as much on set pieces, especially big stuff like this, but this was such a climactic level um, that we called Rescue Jesse. Yeah, we wanted this climactic driving sequence where they crash in the water. And then um, there was a lot of debate of, like, design-wise, do we want to walk all the way back to the theater? So we decided against it. So this was just to set the tone that Ellie and Jesse got away. They are not being actively chased. And this is just a little trick that we do is pull the camera away from them and then that will allow us to cut to where we need to place them. Also an interesting dynamic that we talked a lot about this like this triangle between uh, Ellie, Jesse and Dina. And the thing we really didn't want to do is any sort of jealousy about are Dina and Jesse going to get back together like it was it was never about that but it was just more just Ellie feels isolated and in some ways she I, I th I'm, I'm curious to hear what you think Ashley but I, I think she kind of wants to be she doesn't want to be part of this reunion and she wants oh to, yeah she just wants to dwell on what's next yeah I mean that's how I feel like I was trying to play it because I can relate to that you're like going through something and you're like, I don't want to go through this with anybody else because it's going to be dark. So I'm just going to do it myself. That sequence takes us to one of the flashbacks. There's a whole history with Joel and how Ellie feels about Joel and what Joel did in the hospital. And she doesn't let Dina into any of that. This is just their own personal thing that she's carrying and she's still wrestling with that after his death. Ellie is, is very not great at talking about her feelings which I think is why she's on this mission, because she's not using her words. That's uh, very much a parallel to the first game where um, after the David sequence and Ellie's lost in thought, and then it's like Joel saying, Ellie, Ellie, I think uh, like Ellie has like this some OCD thing where she gets fixated on things and just shuts the world out. I love how, how funny Jeffrey is in this scene. Mm -hmm. He's such a yenta. Yeah. This was a fun scene. Alors, ça t'a plu? Ouais, c'était bien. The two adults don't really understand what's going on, which is Ellie is like this resentment or this curiosity, whatever it is about what Joel did is, is growing. And this thing that she thought she could let go, she can't. And they just attribute it to like, oh, teenager. She's being a teenager. 
Il y a un magasin de musique pas loin. Je suis sûr que tu trouveras ton bonheur. Maybe you should just take him out for an ice cream. Maybe you guys should just hang out. <laughs> I love how he did that lane, and I love the tapping of his foot yeah. under the table. Yeah, sure, Joel, whatever. <laughs> He's so excited. He's like, I did my job. <laughs> Yeah, the, the engineering of this scene, it was important to show that the constant cost of having not made a cure. And here we have these two runaways from Jackson that hmm. have succumbed to the infection. And one more reminder for Ellie that things could have been different. Merci. Oui. But she wouldn't be here. We're also ignoring one of my favorite exchanges in the whole game, which is realizing that Joel does not know that Ellie is gay at this point, <laughs> which comes right before this. Oh my God, that's right. Where he just assumes there's something going on between her and Jesse, and she's right. like, like, I just, she's like, sure, don't. for sure, totally. Yeah. It's like he sees her, but there's like a little bit of a, um, he, he can't quite fully see the full her. Jackson est un endroit merveilleux, mais on ne supportait plus d'entendre les histoires de ces gens qui souffrent partout ailleurs. These are some of the hardest scenes to do, where there's just a lot of exposition and making it seem natural, like as if she's right reading this note for the first time and reacting to it. And again, you two did just such a fantastic job of. Just, I always feel like I'm just watching these characters. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I love the lighting here. Just the way it's framed and silhouetted. It's so Into simple. The wood. Planks. So pretty. <laughs> that look. It's like she's trying to egg you on to start this conversation. No, no. Let's talk about this right now. <laughs> Quand tu m'as fait sortir de l'hôpital des Lucioles. Tu m'as dit qu'il y avait des dizaines de gens comme moi. This is the moment he's been dreading, right? Being confronted head on again with this lie. Oui. C'est ce qu'il m'avait dit. Je connais personne d'autre qui soit immunisé. Et toi Small details, like we had to do different versions of the tattoo. You could see she, she's got it outlined. It's not filled in yet at this stage. There's something about a, a child confronting their parent, the standing in their power, and how trepidatious, even though like, she has the conviction of her argument, right? But just how it still is a thing to stand up to your parent and see me as an adult. What he's doing here is, is kind of fucked up, though, because he gaslights her. He's like, he's so saying, it's like, you're bringing this up now next to these bodies, and he's making her feel shame for having just brought up this topic. Right. That is what I've been telling myself. How many times have I told myself this? Like, if she ever asks, this is what, what I would I tell her. What would I say, yeah? And he just shuts it down. Mm -hmm. But again, it's such great performance with very little dialogue, but you can see how it's just breaking her heart because she doesn't believe any of this. No. I want to add something to No. No, because you'll just lie about it. Yeah, that to me is the greatest sin. And the way you're delivering that no, it's like there's a challenge to him. Like, okay, if that's what you want to say, then that's, we'll go with that. Yeah, because it's just like, no, I don't want to rehash anything else because you're just not going to tell the fucking truth again. I gave you a chance. Yeah. Yeah. Ending images. Hmm. <laughs> Oh, 
Oh, I, I like the, um, your action here, Shannon, which is <clears throat> use your teeth to cut the, the thread. Yes, same. Did I do that? You did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That adds up. There's so much survivalist intimacy in this game. Yeah. So make bien. Hmm. Pourquoi tu lui as pas dit? There's so much you could read out of those faces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Et voilà. Et ça alors, ça donne quelque chose. Uh, there's that fucking map yeah, this again. Is, uh, the, the, this is where the conflict starts to bubble back up between these two. It makes it so much more sad because it's like, no. just stick with Dina. <laughs> Look how you have love and care. It's so interesting because it's what The Last of Us is about. It's like yeah. it, within this room right now, you have like two kinds of love. There's this very positive one with what? Dina and this kind of negative one of like, I got to get the people that hurt the person I love, Joel. What? Yeah. <laughs> and where now the negative one is trumping the positive one. She's got to make the lamb stop screaming, you know? And she's using Tommy as an excuse in a very minor way now and a much more significant way later. And it's it's funny, it's like all these people, like Maria, Tommy, and now Dina realize, I, I can't convince her otherwise. She's mm -hmm. just going to go do it. So all I could do is support her. Well, it's addiction narrative, yeah. right? It's like you, you, you have to wait until and they bottom out. And it's the foreshadowing that eventually Dina says, I can't do it anymore. Oh. Oh. The, the Ellie and Jesse relationship is really kind of fascinating of the respect these characters have for one another and the shared love they have for Dina. And this was a cool shot of just showing what's at stake. We just keep pursuing this thing endlessly. I aspire to be Jesse when I grow up. Me too. Yeah. Such a good dude. Hello, Vince. Also, the idea of um, secrets, right? Characters holding on to these secrets, right? The idea that she's pregnant is a secret uh, that Jesse figures out. Any else? And like, right, it's again, knowing how much Ellie wrestles with characters not telling her the truth. Yeah. And, and I think so much of the wrestling with that was like, I, I shouldn't be the one to tell this information. It's not my place to, but yeah, I don't want to. Don't want to lie. I don't want to lie. And this is starting to lay track of the, the choice that's coming later of, um, I can't just leave Tommy as rationalization. Now that she's like, she had some time away from the torture, the obsession, the call of the hunt is coming back up. The justification, which again, has learned from Joel. Yeah, whittling these scenes down to just the bare essentials, just to make them as tight as possible, to get back to gameplay. That was quite a bit of iteration. Which I feel like speaks so much to what you all do at Naughty Dog is like the scenes don't have a ton of dialogue and so much of it is just through looks or movements. Yeah, well, we're in a privileged position in that we have the budget and the an animators and like the talent that could like translate what you're doing on stage pretty much one to one to what comes out on screen. Um, but it does take a, a lot of effort. <sighs> no. Like, yeah, he's, he's got a lot to process, right? It's just... Yeah, he just found out he's a dad. He just found out he's a dad. And this is like this goodbye because any one of these excursions, you might not come back. And Ellie's surrounded by all these people that want to support her. And they don't quite understand the darkness of the obsession. How do you leave that little punum behind? I know. Look at her. Oh. 
En route. D'après ta carte, l'aquarium est sur la côte. <laughs> It took forever to build this, uh, what we call the wide, which is like the deep background, where you could see the Ferris wheel, you could see just all these obstacles in front of them. On va faire pour traverser. On pourrait prendre cette route. You could see WLF vehicles on that highway. And again, you, when you're acting in this, you, you don't see anything. So then you're just kind of doing gestures, and then based on what, your, what your head is looking at, we build the environment around that. Yeah. Voilà. Yeah, and this is where the obsession completely takes over, where it's like we can go for Tommy or we can go for Abby, but we can't do both. And Ellie rationalizes that going after Abby would be the better choice. On prend le bateau. Tu les as entendus, ils parlaient de Tommy. On n'en sait rien. Qui ça peut être d'autre Même si c'était lui, on pourra jamais le rejoindre. It's, it's so fascinating to think about someone that just has put so much weight of like people being honest to each other. And here she's lying to Jesse and lying to herself. Yeah, I think know. so much of it is her own avoidance. Je viendrai pas te sauver. And now Jesse just sees how dangerous she's become in this obsession and she's losing even him and it's so hard to lose Jesse yeah, and a lot of the construction of this game was these long stretches where Ellie would just be by herself so to put these scenarios where we separate her from the people that love her and wanting the player to feel as alone as she does the roughest scene in the game in one of them Ash Birch, Patrick Fugit. Seeing these glimpses of this other crew and not quite understanding what this fight is about or what the conflict is. Um, only later just getting the other, the, the rest of the context. And this is uh, Ellie trying to be Joel. Ellie trying to do the, the Joel technique of... And this is another one of the situations where Ellie doesn't want to kill them. She just wants Abby. But the situation gets away from her. that she's just on razor's edge of just her emotions completely taken over. Yeah, she definitely doesn't quite, because she's inexperienced in this type of behavior, she doesn't quite have the calm, cool, and collected way of doing it like Joel did. Yeah, and we wanted in this exploration of, um, you know, the pursuit of justice at any cost. Um, that to show that there's always a cost and um, you know in the cycle of violence there's often unintended consequences uh, and the idea that Ellie inadvertently kills a pregnant woman just felt like a great metaphor for that but it definitely horrified some of the people at the studio that um, heard this pitch yeah <laughs> It's an interesting question of, at this point in Ellie's obsession, what could she see that would make her pause, that would make her seriously question after torturing Nora, after leaving Dina behind? Well, you need something big yeah. to yeah. wake her up. And I love um, how you play this panic attack right here. And just the audio design for it as well. And we, we do this trick when Tommy comes in, um, we actually recorded a line with Troy. So she hears Joel for like a split second. You show like all these things are just interconnected in her mind now, all these like traumatic events. Uh, yeah, she's not built for this. <laughs> and just show what a good guy Jesse is. It's like he went and got Tommy and said, we well, gotta hurry and get, get to Ellie yeah, at the aquarium. This was another like clue chain thing we needed to do to set up for later with Abby is the idea that Ellie has this map and in the chaos of this whole moment, she dropped it and didn't even realize it.
pas le faire. Il y a de la neige partout. Non, d'ici à ce qu'on arrive, tout aura fondu. Yeah, this is a bunch of obsessed characters, except for Jesse. Jesse is the most moral character in the story. Um, that all have to accept that it's time to go home. That it, it has to be okay if some of them get away with it. It's like these two, they, they have to convince each other. Il méritait ce qui leur est arrivé. Oh, yeah. Mais elle est encore en vie. So much, <laughs> so much pent up energy under that line. He's still not on board. He's like, well, there is something interesting about how like Ellie doesn't see living as the punishment it is, like living with loss as the punishment it is, even though it's destroying her. In a weird way for Ellie, like it, it would almost be, she's suffering so much. And there's no peace, but she doesn't see that enough to say, I'm okay with Abby living with that level of suffering. Oh, yeah. And losing oh, yeah. everyone she loves. Like, I've taken, I've, now I've made her life miserable. And that would be the triumph. Yeah, in her mind, it's like, she doesn't know what life she's living. She doesn't know what burden she's carrying. She's like, any kind of life, she hasn't paid the price for what she did. It's funny, and yet Ellie is incapable of living herself, right? She's incapable of... Yeah. It's interesting. And this is Tommy just trying to make light of the whole thing. <laughs> I really like this, um, the relationship between Ellie and Jesse and just how much respect they have for each other. I really like th this moment right here. Jesse's just kind of the best. He's the most mature, level, reasonable guy. And Stephen is such a cool dude. Yeah. Such a cool he dude. He's just super like a, chill like, and like, he's kind of like a cowboy. Yeah, like, and he's, he's like, like so a, positive too. He's yeah. Like, even when he'd be like, I'm real tired, real tired. Because yeah. <laughs> over the course of the game, he went from like, newly married to having several triplets. Children. Yeah, I think like <gasps> several children. It's like my friend's problems are my problems. Like, and it just, he puts everybody else over him. He would have been a great baby daddy. No, no good deed goes unpunished. Ugh. I love how abrupt it is. Me too. This is one of the few scenes that Ellie and Abby are together. And when we're making the game, it felt like we we're making two very separate games with yeah. two different casts of characters. And then when they combine, it was such a strange feeling. And she doesn't get it. She doesn't know what this is about. T'as tué mes amis. On vous avait épargné. Et voilà le résultat. Cut the black. Papa! Baby Abby! You can tell because her braid is so much shorter. <laughs> it's, it's interesting uh, in hindsight now watching how when players do this, they think, oh, I'm just going to get a little bit of a glimpse into who she is. They don't know yet. You're only at the halfway point. And we're about to introduce Jerry the Surgeon, played by Derek Phillips, who voiced um, the surgeon in the, f in the first game. Another fun fact is we originally cast him as Henry before we decided really? to drastically change those characters and then gave him the role of the surgeon. But that's before you knew that the second game was happening at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like this role reversal where she's more the adult in this, in this relationship. You're probably thinking about this surgeon that doesn't have much to do until Ellie shows up. Of course, the zebra has comes because, again, this is part of the 
Salt Lake City Zoo where the giraffes escaped that we saw in the first game. Zebra, played by the wonderful Chris Robbins, who uh, doubled for a lot, of, a lot of stunt work as well for many characters on this game and the first game. I bet nobody ever asked you to be a zebra before. <laughs> no, but man, he, he, he did a good it. job of being a zebra tied up in barbed wire. <laughs> And he's like this big former football player, and he's just knocking everybody around here. I love Pat just coming in like, what's going on? Like, yeah, what the fuck is this? That's <laughs> Okay. Right, and then this was originally a mini game where you had to cut the wires off of the zebra. Right. We worked on it for quite a while. And just we eventually... did. That was a long, a long time. Yeah. Okay, now hold still. Yeah. <laughs> right there, that little slip in the mud. Again, that's hand animated. Um... <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> and then it's like, again, it's like the the dad is acting like a child. And this was a stitch point because, again, the volume can only take you so far and those stitches can be really tricky. But it was important in this project to always go outside the volume and just not make you feel... A lot of games, uh, the, the performers can feel really constrained, like in a box. I wanted it to feel freer than that. It's <laughs> possible. Ils sont déjà en train de faire des tests, mais faut que vous alliez voir. Now there's like this glimmer of hope with Ellie and revealing that we're in that same giraffe location. That was all this beauty and wonderment happened in the first game. We always um, stick to the POV of the character you're playing as. So this was like why we're coming into this conversation late, because you're hearing it when Abby hears it. Uh, Merle Dandridge. Come this back. is my first day meeting Merle. Like Merle and I had so many conversations about how conflicted she was about what that has to happen, and then years later to visit the moment when she was arguing with Jerry. I always like that we get more insight into these characters. I like seeing Marlene advocate for Ellie behind the scenes because yeah. she's so resolved in the first game and the show and, and to see that actually, privately, she was advocating. And uh, the parallel here with Jerry from the first game is he's, he's repeating everything that Ellie says right outside on the giraffe sequence in the first game, which is like, all the sacrifices we've made, it can't be for nothing. He's making the same exact argument Ellie does. And then Abby walks in to give her dad an out. And Marlene is done arguing, especially in front of his daughter. The ethical thing Marlene does here is like, I have to tell Joel which is ultimately her fatal oh. mistake. Yeah. I guess Jerry's fatal mistake, too, that he allowed it to happen. <sighs> she sees how conflicted her dad is, and she tries to tell him, it would be okay. I would want you to do it to me. And he can never admit that he wouldn't. You don't think so? Oh. I think he would. I, that's what I love about this. It's like, but he never says it. Yeah, he just kind of has that look of. Maybe he's just glad that it's not her. Yeah. Oof. <laughs> We can't spare any of our characters from seeing the trauma firsthand. Yeah. Joel with Sarah, Ellie with Joel, Abby with Jerry. 
And it's just this, this shared trauma between these characters and now events are set in motion. And now we get to see the other side of what happened after Abby kills Joel. Good, again, this is such a collaborative process. I don't even remember where some ideas come from, if it was editorial or... I think it was editorial. Yeah, but to see the scene again from Abby's perspective and now get the fuller context, which is the whole concept of this game of like, you have one notion of how things go down and then we give you more context and make you question your initial feelings about it. You remember how hard Pat pushed? Um, Alejandro. Alejandro. Uh, yeah, bam, dude, this also good, but Pat specifically would just kind of lose himself in these moments. Stop! Uh, there's your fatal mistake. We're done. Not cleaning up your mess. And now, back to day one. And this is where I think the penny drops for most players that, oh my god, I'm gonna have to replay this entire sequence from the other side. This was fun. Um, City of Thieves was highly inspirational for the first game, written by uh, Game of Thrones co-showrunner David Benioff. And I wanted to put it in the game, and I had just started working with Craig Mazin on a TV show, and he's friends with them. I'm like, can you ask them? He's like, oh, of course. And within five minutes, I had like a text message, like, yeah, no problem, put it in the game. Vámonos. <laughs> okay. I love that Abby and Manny are roommates, that mm -hmm. they're just bros. <laughs> Gender means nothing. It's crazy because we were filming it. I always thought of Manny as this like really fun loving. He is. He's this really fun guy, right? I hadn't even like registered the fact that he had in that scene, like he had spit on Joel. Mm. Mm. And so when I played it and he had done that, I was so angry <laughs> at the character that it took so long to remember that he was a cool guy, <laughs> a cool guy. The irony that Ashley Birch, <laughs> who plays Mel, uh, has to play pregnant while you, Laura Bailey, were pregnant. T'inquiète, on arrive bien from a writing standpoint, this is this is hard, you know, because we're introducing a brand new cast of characters that you're, we're asking you to care about, and we're building a mission that a quest uh, about Owen that's not really related to the revenge quest you've just played half the game with. Um, but there's just a lot of track we have to lay to then get the interesting payoffs. And just showing how close these people that came from the Fireflies are, that despite that they're in a group that's very tribalistic, they have their own tribe within them. And they can be very upset with each other, but there's a protectiveness of their own group. This was hard on the deaf side of, um, you know, we, we captured the scene and we're like, okay, here you see a tower, and now you're gonna pass the gate. And then we had to build all this real estate of this drive uh, that's based on how much performance we have from you all. Oh God, I didn't even think about that. Yeah. And we iterated a lot on just this layout and this turn and like, okay, I want you the truck stop. And then they have to add all the secondary motion to you all, like, because we're not an actual truck when we shoot this. But we all just kind of did this little shimmy shake as we were in that. So <laughs> we did shoot this with Roach, the dog. Roach the dog we did. Remember when Roach would come on set? In his mocap and, suit? And <laughs> in, uh, in his mocap suit, playing Alice. And the whole set would just right fall in love just with take roach pictures, just take selfies with roach it's that's seriously like Merci. roach days were just they were the best days they were the best <laughs> neil do you remember we um there was originally a storyline where 
Mel was actually closer with Jerry because they worked oh. so closely together and there was like some level of contention, historical contention between Mel and Abby for his affection. Right. And we scrapped that because we just, Mel needed to be so likable because she's <laughs> such a uh, hindrance to Abby's happiness. Laura. Est-ce que tu as pu te reposer un peu oh, Je pars bientôt pour l'hôpital du quartier ouest. Les ordres, c'est de toi. Poor Danny. <laughs> this is where uh, Abby gets such a relief that it's not Owen. Because this whole time there's this dread building that she thinks she's about to see Owen's body. Oh, where Owen J'en sais rien. Il y a quelques jours, on a... on a repéré des scars près de la marina. Character model has incredible arms. I... Yes, I was just looking at her arms. I mean, everybody talks about Abby's arms, but... Yeah, but damn. Nora's arms. Nora's the sleeper. In this scene, we finally establish what's about to become Abby's next goal, which is rescue Owen. Um, and we come back to the theme of this <laughs> this uh, series, which is love. Il m'a lancé un regard de tueur et il m'a dit d'en parler à personne. This is one more example of the tribe within the tribe of she's telling them stuff they should not know because she trusts them, she cares for them more than she cares for the wolves, the WLF. Who is Isaac? Now we gotta go see the big man. Pour dernière nouvelle, il était dans l'immeuble. It's kind of cool to again build this guy up, and then give you a glimpse of uh, the person that runs the WLF. Salut, Abby. On doit monter. Isaac est là-dedans. Ah. This was another one of those sequences where we didn't want to be confined to the volume. If I remember correctly, we um, we mapped out uh, with tape on the floor of like this floor. Then you go into the, <laughs> just a marked area that's going to be the elevator, and then you come out, and the whole place is marked differently when you're in Isaac's suite. Monsieur, Abby and Manny sont là. And here we have the fantastic and very scary Jeffrey Wright. There's a dehumanization that happens um, when you're in conflict with a, another group for so long and there's so many like retributions that they get to a place where you can't torture them because they're so dehumanized. And we get to see how easy it is for Isaac now that he just sees them as, as pure enemies. We met Jeffrey Wright because his son was such a big fan of the first game and talking to him I offered him uh, this role and he was very excited to take it on so it was, it was fun to work with him even if a little intimidating at times just because his gravelly voice is so so creepy Qu -ce qui se passe, chef? Cette petite guerre a assez duré. Ça peut pas continuer comme ça. Alors, uh, quoi? This was another obstacle we're throwing in Abby's way, which is, um, in the past, Isaac has given her a lot of rope because of how capable she is to pursue Joel. Um, but here, he can't afford to have anybody leave because they're going to go all out to kill every last scar, as he would call it. I remember in like early iterations of the script, having a bunch of scenes, not a bunch, but having scenes with Isaac, where he was very much a mentor for her mm -hmm. and almost like a surrogate father figure yep. as she was growing up. Those were early versions of the story or yeah. just in trying to shrink this behemoth down, we um, end up cutting. But uh, the other thing you could see here is uh, Jeffrey Wright has a limp. Uh, and the reason for that is if you look at the concept art, he has an amputated leg. Uh, and there's no opportunity to really see it, but um, 
the limp is still there. Uh, and then uh, we did so many takes, and Jeffrey insisted on eating an apple in every take <laughs> just to make it authentic. So he ate a bunch of apples. To Laura's point, we we wrote scenes. I remember drafting scenes where he's coming in as trying to be sort of a Tommy, like a father figure uh, after she's lost her dad. And you come to realize how intimate their relationship is, um, but it's something that she can, she will very quickly give up in the face of Owen being in trouble. And as soon as she connects with Lev again, she's willing to give that up. But couldn't do it for time. You get little hints of it because I feel like our relationship in this scene, you can see that they've, he's given her things in the past. She's yeah. used to being able to get her way. And uh-huh. that one line, the way he delivers it, like stop gossiping about it. Like the idea of that you guys need to stop like being this like Salt Lake City crew. You're part of a bigger group now. Yeah. There are things mm-hmm. more important. And even here, he's like saying, when the time comes, we'll do what's right. Yeah, at this point, you you find him to be, I think, torturing aside, like, he's a very fair leader with her. Mm -hmm. He's given her a lot, and then now he expects her to step up for ultimately a a three-day assault. The way he behaves, again, this is like a (laughs) one... Uh, broken record, which is uh, he loves his people. Mm-hmm. He's going to go commit atrocities because of how much he loves the people that look up to him. He's going to burn a village filled with children. Right. Owen n'aurait jamais tué Danny pour un scar. Quoi? Non. Abby, reste ici. Je serai revenu avant l'aube. Couvre-moi jusque là. Isaac va te botter les fesses. Abby doesn't care about this assault in the same way that Joel didn't care about finding a cure. It's just about the people that are close to us. And now we head into her head for flashback. The most fun scenes to shoot. (laughs) This was fun watching you two be so playful. They were like a little respite from all of the... (laughs) The horror. The horror that we were shooting. But again, establishing Abby has vulnerabilities, right? Not just uh, emotionally, but she has a deep, deep, deep fear of heights, which then gives Lev an opportunity to help her. Just interesting, um, these characters that here with Owen and then the other time with Joel, when he takes Ellie to the museum, of these gifts that they give the people that they love. Um, and here it's like he brought her to show her this beautiful aquarium as a show of his love. Well, he's trying to write in the same way as as Joel after David. He is trying to get back to the Abbey that was. He's trying to get back to the dynamic that they had. And he's putting all of his heart into bringing her joy in the hopes that he can get confirmation that that person is not dead. It is Darwin. Right. We had had these long talks about how Abby, like, is so serious and doesn't want to, <laughs> doesn't want to joke around. She's not a jokester. And I think Pat just, like, took that and ran because every single time we would shoot, he would try to make me laugh as we were shooting as, like, a challenge. No! Owen! At this point, Abby also, I think, is trying to be the person everybody wants her to be. She's trying to be the old version of Abby. She's trying to be the loyal soldier to Isaac, who has given them a home and a purpose. She's still figuring out 
who this new version of her is. And reinforcing her fear of height. When we shot that, though, do you remember how pregnant I was? Remember how terrified <laughs> I was because you're jumping off this, like, two-foot platform. It had to be. It was higher than two feet, right? Three Tell feet. Tell me it was higher than Three two feet. Three feet. Uh, but every time you landed hard on the ground, I'm like, oh, my God, a baby's going to fall out of her. <laughs> This was like a nice, short and sweet little cinematic. Also a fun thing to shoot when you're like coming up from underwater. <laughs> <laughs> and then I remember you have to do this prep as if you're diving and transition in and out of gameplay. Uh-huh. I like this, these, I, this, these kind of air pockets that would still have remained here. <gasps> <laughs> You held your breath a lot yes. while shooting some of these scenes. I love this scene. Yeah, this, this whole sequence is for this scene. Nick, but poor Owen loves Abby so much and she's just so stuck with this. Well, grief, I guess, that she can't let go. The, the injustice that she can't let go. You could argue that what Owen is going through is a smaller version of what Abby is going through, right? Like, he's in love with this girl. He's fixated on her. He's ready to go on this journey with her and risk things for her, and all he wants in return is a little bit of love. And she just can't. She can't. This is just... She's not the person she was anymore. It's this, this notion that somehow, if she's happy, she's disrespecting... The loss of her father. Yeah. No. She can't allow herself to be too happy. <laughs> and he's still trying to make light of it. Look at look at him. He's so cute. Patrick Fugit is a very charming man. Very. She did it. Papa, excuse me. Qu'est-ce qui va pas? Just let him in. Je sais qu'on a suivi toutes les pistes possibles, mais... Mais Joël est là, quelque part. Je sais. And we get the sense that this is not the first time they're having this conversation. No, this is the end of their intimate relationship, right? He's yeah. going to try and move on is, with Mel. It's not going to work out. This is the breakup scene. Not how he envisioned this moment going, I have no. a feeling. Well, I, I, I kind of get this idea, like, like, look what I brought you. I brought you underwater. What else can I do? There are seals swimming around. <laughs> it's just not enough. So sad. I mean, it's, it's very much a parallel to what we see, a much worse version of this in Ellie on the farm with Dina. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm to tell you. Ne t'excuse pas. Flashback number two for Abby. Yeah. So this scene also, the sequence had to do a lot of work because we're once again resetting. You have to learn where she and Owen are in their relationship. Uh, feel that tension, feel the family dynamics. He's so surprised to see her. Salut. Salut. Est-ce que tout va bien? Uh, ouais. I love the set, man. The set took so many Forever. iterations to Forever. get right, but it was it was really important that it felt gorgeous. To justify why this guy has holed up in here for so long. C'est quoi tout ça? It's festive. You haven't yet seen This is our Christmas episode. I admire a bit this view. A thing you might not appreciate until you sort of really play this is this aquarium had to meet so many different needs because it's in so many different levels. Right. And so to make sure that all of those could work together was um, painstaking, especially for the layout designers. No. 
Écoute-moi ça. Et alors La vue est chouette. Oh, t'exagères. Un rabat-joie. Tu veux que je monte Ouais, je préfère. Euh, elle, elle est à fond sur les trucs de Again, look at this effort he puts in. Yeah, there's this a beautiful tension between these characters that still clearly very much love each other. But he did this for Mel, right? Yeah, this is this for is Mel. Right, but look how excited he is that Abby's here. I know, he's trying to move I doubt, on. I doubt he's this excited when Mel's here. <laughs> Poor Mel. <laughs> but I think Poor he Mel. wants to be, right? I think he yeah. wants to move on with Mel. He wants, he knows she's inaccessible. Well, yeah, Abby's a dead end. Qu'est-ce qui te met d'aussi bonne humeur? Qui est moi? I love that he misreads this, like he thinks this is somehow about him, and now he's going to convince her to stay. But she's in a good mood because. J'ai trouvé le frère de Joël. They found Joel's brother. Il est dans un camp dans le Wyoming. Comment tu le sais? On a mis la main sur des lucioles qui faisaient partie de son groupe. Je croyais qu'il avait raccroché il y a une dizaine d'années. Ouais. Et donc, ces types ont eu de ces nouvelles récemment C'est une piste. Il faut que j'en sache plus. Ok, mais tu sais bien que même si tu le retrouves, même s'il est là-bas, il saura peut-être pas où est Joël, d'accord Right, because at this point, we're already... Canonically, he's already starting to have issues killing scars. And we're not really talking about it, but there's some track getting laid. He's losing his taste for violence. I like that he was the last person that she went to go talk to about this. Isaac is d'accord. Mon cul, oui. Personne ne tient à la justice plus que lui. Il sait ce que Joël a fait. I love that, that look, it's like, you promised me. If we get, like, any clue, you promised me. He doesn't want to be the, the last holdout. But he's like Jesse, he's never not going to go. If his people are going. Oh. <laughs> the Paris sequence. This scene. Oh, yes. Was this... Was this one of the first things yes, we shot? Yeah, because it was for Paris Games yeah. Week. Paris Games Week, yeah. Mm -hmm. We shot this way in advance. I think it was like a day or two before we shot this. That I'm like, we could do this all as one shot. And like I had sketched out like these kind of storyboards real quick. And then uh, came up with this hazy plan with uh, Matt Neapolitan, our cinematographer for this game. Like take after take of getting dragged by your arms. <laughs> uh, this was another one where um, we actually strung Laura up with. We had like two ropes, one that was around your neck to just give you a little bit of tension that you mm -hmm. could lean into as much as you wanted, and then another one that held your body up in the air. Yeah. Oh, but man, this was so much work, and like we scrutinized the tiniest details in the scene. When this came out originally, people thought that she was... Uh, Anna. Anna. Yeah. That she was Ellie's mom. They were watching the narrative of how Ellie came to be. And these uh, seraphites that at times you might feel sorry for them and you see them getting tortured. And then... And then see that, you know... Oh, wait a minute. Uh, here, the lead Seraphites in this scene is played by Emily Swallow in Small World. She's of Mandalorian fame, acting along uh, Pedro Pascal. And uh, later we find out this is a bastardization of, of this thing of like, freedom so they may know my love wasn't meant as like disembowel them. Liberally. The intro of Victoria Grace plays Yara. Yeah, this scene has a lot of heavy lifting. It's introducing like two major characters of Yara and Lev. 
again this 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 idea that keeps repeating in this story of like the tribe within a tribe that even though these are all Abby's enemies Seraphites somehow they have it in for these two kids and again this is one of those weird opportunities I know it sounds dark but like in seeing the violence against these kids it's much easier to immediately understand why Abby makes the choices she makes they may be their enemy but these are kids getting hurt Lighting a scene is really hard. Uh, lighting a scene that's one take, where the camera's constantly moving around in 360 degrees and making sure all those angles still look good, is close to impossible. So kudos to our lighting team. The face change, is she, ugh. The face change, the flow of blood, the water, there's, there's so many things that um, done improperly would take you out of the scene. Uh, and then, we spent a lot of time, even to the hands right there, I remember we spent so much time making sure you see the tension in the hands as she's suffocating. The shirt, and make sure the shirt felt wet and it's sticking to her skin, and it's a little bit translucent because it's wet. That's the kind of detail that Naughty Dog is crazy about. So this is the introduction of Ian Alexander, and a fun thing to watch as you watch his face throughout the game is, I think it was um, lead character Ashley Swadowski came up with it, but if you look at his scars, one of them is a little crooked uh, and wobbly, and the idea that like, you see there's physical representation of his hesitation in this religion, even on the scars on his face. And yet, I think the beautiful thing with him is that he remains a believer yeah. all the way through. Yeah. His faith partly saved him, right? Because he saw the beauty in the mm. intention. Fed gaff. Scene that just, I, I say this over and over, but it's um, such beautiful, soft lighting. Right, and so at this point, they've worked together for as long as they need to, but they're off to go on their separate missions. They don't need to be friends. That taking off of the shirt is so hard. I can't tell people how hard it is. <laughs> the raindrops again, this window were difficult. Um, My high school friend has become a renowned plastic surgeon, uh, Jacob Steiger, uh, and he gave me some advice here on this injury and what you would need to do to treat it. Right, and this is also a reminder that while Abby took a different path, she comes from doctors, from care. She understands the body, even if she never particularly prioritized it. <laughs> Victoria and Ian were great in this. Just how Ian has to play both being scared for his sister and just angry at this wolf that he has to work with. Come on, Steppe. This is a recurring um, theme throughout both games, that the idea of giving someone's name is a way to show do you trust them. Merci de m'avoir libéré. Love this theme again. I like the conflict of leaving them, knowing you're dooming them. Oh, this is... She thinks, I'll give them a warning and I'll be enough. I don't need your fucking help. Look at the lighting on the hair. This game is still very impressive. Owen? Ah. Oh, this scene going. turned out to be uh, a bit more controversial than we anticipated. <laughs> <clears throat> the irony here is... 
as much as this is the counterpoint sex scene to Ellie's sex scene, <laughs> we don't. Oh, I guess we do show a little more. He's a show a little bit more. Yeah. Um, well, we'll get to that in a second. But uh, I, love, I love this interplay between you two. And um, yeah, we really wanted to give Pat something meaty. And this this monologue, which he just. I, for my money, knocked it out of the park. Then you know. Of like visualizing this moment where he just he just can't do this violent thing anymore. It's not him. Tu peux me dire ce qui s'est passé? I like that she's been strung up and beaten and almost killed. And that none of that's important right now. I just got to come in and sit down and watch him work. <laughs> and this idea of the tribe within the tribe, and um, there's no secrets between these two. The idea that he, right, he's just been sitting here drinking, conflicted, and I mean, he's about to leave his baby mama. That's how much he can't stay in this place. He feels like he's losing his soul. And this this look right here, it's like there's a part of Abby that, that knows what he's saying is true. But that, that sense of duty to this group that has taken care of them is still there, but starting to erode. Je <sighs> pouvais pas. Well, we're watching her maturity in real time. Especially having come up of seeing two seraphites up close and saving them too. I like, I like that there's so much like unspoken between them that's about to come to the surface of like, Abby thinks he's so naive and he thinks what she did was so awful, but clearly they've never talked about it until now. And then there's yeah. the underlying love they have for each other, and obviously attraction. It's just, it's all like, it's so messy. I, I, I like the messiness of this relationship. And it would have been like, I know our goal here is to create empathy for Abby, um, to show you the other side of this journey. And, and this, this definitely was a risk to say, okay, she's gonna <laughs> have a sort of affair with this guy that got this other girl pregnant, her friend. But um, this primal thing that's going on between them just overpowers logic. And t to me, that was more important to create empathy is to show how human they are than to just make them righteous or right the whole time. No, they're trying to, they're trying to define good in a gray world. And that means they have to make messes. This little pause, it's, it's, it's a nice bit of acting. Elle est en sécurité ici. C'est ça. On en reparle demain quand t'auras des cuvées. C'est pas ça. Faire quoi? Me traite pas comme un cinglé. Je sais que tu penses comme Knows her more than she knows herself. Si les Lucioles sont vraiment à Santa Barbara, Je préfère me barrer dans la direction and the resentment that she has for the fireflies, because in her mind, that's part of the reason her dad died, is... They failed her. Yeah. No. They, they failed in every way. Yeah. Désolé d'être adulte. Tu devrais essayer. It's just uh, the insulting and just... Comment je fais ça, Abby? And there's this, like, this, this notion that's like, your, your best friends can hurt you the most. And the, the flash of violence here of anger is like Abby never talks about it, but clearly she is haunted by what she did to Joel. Yeah. And he's finally seeing that. Yeah. And then once they touch, it's over. Abby. I think they're both incredibly lonely characters. Yeah. Yeah, he's in this other relationship, but clearly he's lonely and he's been longing for her. And I know people ask this question, why why show this? Why you could end the scene right here? Um, 
I disagree, though. But I disagree as well, because I think it's important to show the, the, the vulnerability, how vulnerable these characters can be with each other. But mm. there's also, again, it's, it's messy and dirty and loving and a little violence at the same time. My philosophy on sex scenes is you should take them to the point where you've gotten all the information needed or the emotional evolutions needed. And in this case, I think you needed to see her conflicted and give in. Yeah, surrender to the moment. This was a concept we came in quite late of showing a nightmare. But showing that now that this nightmare that she's having about her dad is now switched. And uh, this like burn that Owen has on the, on his back, this was uh, another Ashley Swadowski idea that um, like we do environmental storytelling, we could do stuff on the body or through scars or disfiguration that tells you a story. I love that at her core, Abby is a protector. Mm -hmm. She's Joel. She's Joel. Yeah. Right, so now the dread, she's too late. Faites pas un pas de plus! C'est moi! I like the, the change that Lev goes through here. Of like, he's relieved to see her and he's ashamed that he hasn't been able to protect mm -hmm. his sister. I really like her trigger etiquette. She took her finger off that trigger as soon as she heard his voice. Classy. Good job, Laura. Good Thank job, you. Laura. There's this little bit of storytelling of the jacket on top of her that now she's feverish. <laughs> um, mm. Sometimes we get these uh, unintentional parallels. Like th this one comes to mind of um, Ellie and Winter needing medicine for Joel. Mm -hmm. And now this becomes, this is about to become a, a goal for Abby and Lev. I think that one of the things about this game that I like is just keeps reminding you in how many ways we are fragile. Owen! This is one of the things I did for uh, Owen! training when I started working out for, for Abby. My husband, Travis, got me a 100-pound sandbag. I had to carry. And I had to carry it. Oh, damn. And then I get pregnant. This is a neat moment, right? These dogs have been trained to, like, tear scars apart. And now they're here. Abby, qui sont ces gosses? I mean, this is probably the first time they've ever come this close to Seraphites without fighting them. I wonder if Owen right now is thinking, like, I mean, I said not kill them. We don't have to, like, fucking go this far. It wasn't me. And I was like, yeah, right. <laughs> I don't know, it just looked that bad. It's just a little pink. It's just it's a, a little tan. smooshy. <laughs> yeah. No. Je voulais le nettoyer et le remettre. Là, c'est en miette. Well, like, uh, there's a moment here that I always find funny where, like, Owen tries to suggest, like, just cutting it and burning it. And I th <laughs> Laura, you make him feel like an idiot. <laughs> Yara est un soldat. Elle, elle a besoin de son bras. What I love in the scene is even though Mel has very little dialogue outside of tending to Yara, you can see in her performance, in Ashley Birch's wonderful performance, in her body language, that she is very much soured to Abby since last we saw her. And hopefully it's very subtly asking the question of how much does Mel know? L'infection naturelle. You fucking moron. Fais-moi une liste. Abby is like such a singularly minded person. Like when she gets fixated on something, nothing will get in her way. I don't know anyone else like that. 
évitez les zones inondées ou... Vous évitez, vous. Elle peut tenir deux heures Peut-être, oui. This idea of the sky bridges and that um, uh, wolves never look up. It's actually show, it's an idea we got from our focus test is that um, we, we build these elaborate levels and then we find players look left and right and almost never turn the camera upwards. Um, so this idea that they're patrolling these streets and they never look up to see these secret paths that the Seraphites are using. Abby. Oh yeah, you calling Abby right now? Look at the way Mel's looking at him. <laughs> Hey. There's also, um, there's, the, again, it's kind of a messy theme, but the idea of that we've done certain things and it feels like we can never get past them. And for Owen, it's like, oh, I got this girl pregnant. Does that mean this relationship is doomed and it could never happen? That's the way Abby sees it. But for his mind, it's like nothing is ever final. There's always a chance for like a new beginning. Toi, peut-être. Hmm. That's a nice, sweet little moment. And Lev's just like, I'm like, not oh, here. Well, I am not know. here. <laughs> yeah, there's so much unsaid that, again, we, we have the privilege of Naya Dog being able to capture the, the, such small nuances of your performance that we don't have to rely on dialogue as much. Her worst fear realized. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine how bad that would oh. smell? I like that Abby is like, let me recover from near death. And Lev's like, I'm good, let's go. And he's just staring he just at her bounced. awkwardly. Yeah. It was so great on the stage. <laughs> Looking up and just seeing him. <laughs> okay, but I'm going to keep staring at you awkwardly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to. Just back up one step. The sequence between Abby and Lev used to be short, significantly shorter, and Lev used to be the one that died and Yara survived, and it's because we saw the dynamic between you two. Oh, that really? It, it caused us to have this ripple effect that changed the story and eventually led to us changing the ending and having Abby survive. What? Really? This yeah. <sighs> Metal mask. So this is my favorite level in the whole game. And narratively, this level had to do a lot of work, not just because, hey, now we're gonna learn more about Seraphite culture and what this is and who Lev is, but this level has to earn, ultimately earn Abby's um, willingness to walk away from the wolves. Si tu meurs, je serais coincé ici. She has like, to, I she like has to the, build the, love. The, the banter that's forming between these two characters. As they get more comfortable with each other, they're okay insulting each other in this funny <laughs> way. Tiens, c'est cadeau. On perd du temps. On peut pas aller plus vite. C'est pas en mourant tous les deux qu'on va aider ta sœur. Voilà. Ça va aller. He has no idea what backgammon is. It's, it's an interesting dynamic because he's he's been so um, secluded from the world. He knows even less than Ellie did in the first game. Which makes you think about, like, you know, if we were to come back years later, people that would be born years and years later, like, just the world we know seems more and more distant. 
Salut. Vita girl. Salut. Now from the other side. Ouais, c'est la joie. <laughs> J'ai besoin de matériel médical. Tu peux me dire où ils sont. Salut. Je viens de parler à Isaac. Tu retournes à la base avancée. Laisse-moi contacter Isaac. Tu lui parleras en personne. Tu pars avec le prochain chargeur. You're fucked. Yeah. Qu'est-ce que tu fais Elle a disparu. Trying to look confident though, you guys. <laughs> Tell by my body posture. <laughs> Donne-moi tes mains. She's not yet willing to fight them. Mm -mm. She's surrendering to them. They're not her enemy yet. Just staring daggers into his face though. Like, are you really going to do that? Chelsea Tavares um, did a really fantastic job as Nora. It was important that all of you had really good chemistry. That just you have to sell years of friendship in very short scenes. Il me faut du matériel médical. Pourquoi? Qu'est-ce qui lui arrive? And again, this just myopic focus. Syndrome des loges. Son bras est foutu. Tu vas pas le soigner, j'espère. Ce sera Mel. She's not right. Uh, interesting that even here, that the, these people love each other. Putain. That there is <laughs> tribes within a tribe within a tribe. Because she's, yeah, lying to Nora. On n'a pas encore vidé les étages inférieurs. Il y aura ce qu'il me faut. Build up for the scariest fight. <laughs> We're about to get into our. Uh, Resident Evil homage. <laughs> She's so cool. Nora? Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, this one will bite you in the ass. But, all right. <laughs> I like that she's ready to pummel whoever it is that grabbed her. Uh, and this is something we'll see with uh, Yar later as well, which like these kids are told to stay put and they're starting to care so much for Abby, they, they don't stay put. Ils sont tous à ta recherche. T'as fait quoi au juste? Rien du tout. Je t'avais dit de pas bouger. J'ai pas eu le choix. Tes amis sont absolument partout. I, I really like this, the glue that happens between this scene and the next and showing this river rapids ride. And it has very much this Apocalypse Now feeling that you know you're you're cruising through a war torn area. This game is so ugly. <laughs> <laughs> this was a uh, this this little sequence. I, I think this was suggested by. Um, Joe, our editor on this game. I love, I love these murals. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes these like kind of connecting shots I find really beautiful. Just giving you a little bit of a gap in time. Now this shifted relationship with Lev and Alice. Oh yeah, and Lev's and just like, been taught to fear those dogs. Right. They just rip them apart. And another example of just the beauty of animals in this world and oh. how they represent innocence. Dora does baby. <laughs> I just I'm staring at the animation on the fingers and how well done it is. Yeah. All this time after what they did to Joel, after all the seraphites they've killed, finally meeting these two kids just starts to put it all in perspective for Abby. Her body figures it out before her head does. What happened to us, right? That's the most she's going to talk about all these things that she's done. If 
to death. <laughs> the idea that, you know, even when we fail, we still have to push forward for something better. That's what Owen represents. Okay. Something so beautiful and sad here when we reveal the missing arm and this exchange of a smile between these two characters. I know at time I'm going to sound like a broken record, but it's just, I, I love showing off your performances with no dialogue. It just makes our job easier as writers. <laughs> just leave out the writing. That's the secret to good writing. Leave out the writing. And finally she has one good night of sleep. Yeah, but consciousness is about to slap her in the face. <laughs> Owen? Uh -oh. <laughs> Oof. Yeah. Like that Mel doesn't even, you're not even worth my time to talk about it. But then she snaps. She's so powerless in this situation. Oh, and this was a fun B because he did just learn how to say fuck you. <laughs> Owen leur a proposé d'aller à Santa Barbara. Ça, c'est tout, Owen. She's trying to be jokey and connect with Mel. Hoping that she doesn't know. Right. En fait, je pars avec eux. Je ne veux plus te voir. Ouf. Quoi? Il a peut-être gobé ton numéro avec les gosses. Mais moi, non. Tu crois que je fais semblant La meilleure tueuse d'Isaac qui s'entiche de deux scars It's such an insult, right? But it's like, um, she probably deserves it. But the idea that she's only being nice to these kids to earn favor with Owen. Yeah. It's so sad that she doesn't fight back because she probably agrees with her. Oh, fully. Fully. Well, I think Mel is also calling into question, like, can, can characters change? Can people change? We see it with Joel, but it happens so rarely, right? And so many of our characters are myopically focused and can't change no matter what. So I understand why she feels like this must be bullshit. No, but she finally feels like, oh, God, I'm, I'm doing the right thing. I'm finally doing the right thing. Maybe I can be better. And then, like, this... Right. Instant back to reality. I like that um, showing emotion in this world is somehow a weakness. Sweat t-shirt. <laughs> we had read a lot on what was on that shirt. We had, yes. I just, I just remember I just we had all the these thing. all these different designs that were just too distracting, and finally we ended up with something pretty subtle. Ça va ton bras. Because she'd need an aquarium shirt. Why does that otter look so sad? <laughs> Otter lost its arm too. <laughs> uh, I remember a conversation I had with Victoria here about uh, Yara's motivation, how she's um, she feels like she needs to repay Abby in some way, and she's complimenting her and she's pulling her in to like find Lev, but more for Abby's sake than for actually finding Lev. Oh, this was a, this was a tough one to write. Lev! 
Oh, yeah. Pourquoi il fait ça Je me demandais, tu crois qu'il pourrait convaincre ta mère Si elle le voyait comme ça, elle lui sauterait dessus pour l'étrangler. The conflict between love and duty of like the love a mom should have for her kids and the duty she has for her religion. I like here that Yara is the practical one. She sees the world as it is and she sees the consequences as they are. And in some way, in another universe, she and Abby would be wonderful enemies <laughs> because they are both strong, myopic soldiers. Right, but for Yara, the risk to Lev's life is worth giving everything up. And the guilt, right, this guilt here. Well, it says that it's also Yara has greater love for Lev than their mom had for Lev. That this moment that she's describing here is what made her lose faith. And we don't talk about it, but uh, I think the difference that I see between Yara and Lev is that Yara has lost her faith and Lev has just refocused it, um, went back to the origins, the writings, and sees how it was um, corrupted. Uh, this is another one of those scenes. I, I thought um, Victoria here just knocked it out of the park. Yeah. Yeah. I, li I like these uh, in these action games, sometimes having a goal of like, oh, let's find a toy to cheer up a kid. <laughs> and that becomes your gameplay objective. Et ça, t'en dis quoi? C'est parfait. Mais Another attends. brilliant thing Ashley Swodowski sort of conceived of is you watch the kids visually change and, and move away from scars over the course of this game. So here we see Yara is now dressed like uh, a civilian, but she still wears the braids. She's not fully letting go. Uh, yeah, we're about to get into this conversation of... Um, I mean, they're talking about their relationship, but uh, uh, thematically there's greater stuff here, which is when are things too late? When have you gone so far that there's no coming back from it? They are very literal. <laughs> <laughs> they're literal people. It's funny he says he sucks with kids, but I think Owen would be a great dad. Oh, I think he'd be an incredible dad. Another world. Tu viens Santa Barbara? Huh? Je peux pas. He's such an optimist, right? He's about to talk about that. We'll figure it out. I don't know how, but we'll figure it out. Again, going back to something you said earlier, Neil, but it's like this idea that Suffering is the way that we honor the dead. I don't think Abby has fully admitted, like, no, I, I don't have a right to be happy. There's no... <laughs> yeah. Lève! Reviens ici! Lève! 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 This is, uh, this is their last conversation together. I think there's a part of Abby that knows she's about to head into a suicide mission. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And this is her forcing Owen to stay here. She's really trying. She's trying. The irony mm. is in staying here, she dooms what, them. She abandons them, yeah. Dooms him.
I don't know when it is in gameplay that you realize, like, oh, God, I, I killed them all as Ellie. <laughs> you know what I mean? What did I do? Is that a sniper rifle? Uh-oh. Oh, I'm back to wish to recover. No, she fois. Girl, you have one arm. She is so tough. She's badass. But uh, yeah, Abby doesn't want any more blood on her hands. So just like with Owen, she's she wants Yara to stay behind. Really like the dynamic between Abby and Manny. Just a couple of bros. A couple of bros. Tell me so cool. It's so interesting how very few players uh, guessed that this was Tommy right oh, here. Oh, really? Yeah. Just because it's been so long and you, you forget about yeah, yeah. there's a whole other cast of characters that are on this island and now um, these two stories are starting to merge. Right, at first it feels coincidental, like, oh, she just happens on Manny. It's like, no, Manny was targeted. <laughs> the revelation, it's Tommy. What? No wonder he was so good. Like, oh, right, this whole other game that's happening finally collides. <laughs> if you don't see a character die on screen, you should always question their death. That music is so Daddy. ominous. I like how she's just burying the death of her friend. Yeah. Just stay, fo again, she has this very narrow, focused mind. And the realization that it's all going to come crashing down. And the guilt, I would imagine, right? Like, the thing I would be burying in that moment is, oh, that's that guy? Oh, I'm complicit in the death of my friend. This is another one of those that, if you were to see the making of it, be so funny, because they're like, <laughs> OK, and wave. <laughs> and and wave. wave, and you'll have to <laughs> act the physics of the boat. <laughs> and then later, the animators like touch it up. In the earlier days of this game, there were five days that the girls were sort of doing their thing in Seattle. And now we're on their territory. There was a whole day where Ellie would go to Scar Island to give you this, this opportunity to see them in the same nurturing way that we would see the stadium, where you get to see them take care of their children and their seniors, and you get to see them farming, and you get to see them be human people. But we cut it because, ultimately, it didn't shift Ellie's journey. Oh, oh, this, scene. This, this is a heavy scene. Mm. Unlike the rest of the game, which is just... A comedy. <laughs> <laughs> that shift right there for Yara is really nice of going from grieving to protecting. Concerns. Consoling, yeah, that's right. Those cuts. And she knew it was going to happen. She knew that's what the outcome was going to be. Lives an optimist. With everything that baby Lev has been through in this past week, this is truly the death of his innocence. Mm -hmm. Now these three have become the us, and the WLF is about to become the them. There's this um. This little connective tissue right here of, um, or this moment of connection between Abby and Lev that I love, that she hands him the bow. Just the exchange, again, this, this exchange between them. My baby, baby. <laughs> oh, sweet baby. All she can do is arm him. I see. Oh, this is, uh... This is the... Yeah. Uh, so, right, we're... originally you would come into to this island, and this is where we would have killed Lev and 
Yeah. Mm, we had these these concepts of um, stone mound graves and that you would find love being buried in one. But instead, we flippity flopped it. It's funny, it's like Abby stopping Lev from doing the thing she couldn't even do is grief for yeah. the person she loves. And there's our second Isaac scene. Well, not a good this, look. This was really fun watching you guys play and this back and forth. It's like every other time you've been able to reason with Isaac, but he's at the end of his rope. Isaac doesn't see a kid, you know? Pour t'éloigner de ce scar. Un. Tu vas vraiment me tuer? Deux. Je vous avais pas compris. That, that facial expression was great. No! Putain de merde! And uh, Jeffrey Wright gave us a lot of deaths, a lot of falling in all these different ways. I remember that. Uh, this was another one of those where we wanted to make the volume feel bigger and run with the characters. And then we had a hard time, I don't know how much you remember, Laura, of like getting what this beat to land right here, this exchange between the two characters until we somehow, I don't remember the exact order of events, we came up with this, this line right here. You're my people. Yeah, we were on the stage and it just wasn't quite working. And you came to me and you said, let's come up with some, let's brainstorm some other lines. And I said, you're my people. And you're like, okay, that's it. And you just walk back on set. And it really, it, it, it's become, it's become my favorite line in the game because it is, to me, it is the unifying idea. This oh. one here is actually one of my favorite scenes in this game. I agree, this one's really great. It's just the visuals, the, the, the exchange, how far we've come. Um, just the idea that he's cold, the weather. Um, she's again, so uh, dull here, she's just such a dad here. This is, again, yeah. this is one of those things that's very easy to write on the page. She takes her jacket off, she wraps it around Lev. Very hard to execute and oh, make God. it look good. Look how she's looking at him. Well, it's like now she's looking at a small version of herself, right? Yeah. She knows what it is to see your parent dead, to see your world burn, and now she's just got to helplessly watch another person do it. This is, again, where the... the Two stories are barreling into, <laughs> into each other. Um, and we have a series of losses. I mean, there's a, this nice dramatic irony. The player already knows what's waiting for Abby inside, and they're like, oh my God, oh my God, yeah. oh my God. And they're waiting to see how this goes. If plays they remember, out. a lot of people forget. No. Really? But as, as soon as they see Alice. Oh, yeah, Alice is the, Alice that, is that's the trigger. That's the giveaway. What can you say to someone that just had, just lost his mom and his sister at the same moment? Why? Alice is the only dog that actually has to die in the game, which was a fun thing during um, press when people would be like, why do you want us to kill dogs? And it's like, you don't actually have to in any of the setups, they're all voluntary kills, but Alice is the only requisite one. I'm pretty sure we're always careful to say you don't have to kill dogs, but we didn't say you don't have to kill dog. dog. The cutest dog that you play fetch with. This is, um, Laura, you make this look very easy, but this is a very hard scene, I, I think, watching from the outside to, to act, which is you have to go from grief to pure rage. Uh, I think, uh, Hallie, this was your throwing up that you wrote into this scene. Yes, yeah. probably. It's such a great vision no. of how much grief somebody can take 
before your body just rebels against you. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like this, this little, the way he says Abby here. Abby. Almost afraid to show her this might lead to the people that did this. And of course, this was Ellie's mistake of dropping the map here in her panic attack. And, uh, <laughs> and the music is doing a good job of just taking you internally into Abby's head. Now she's regressing back to the vengeful spirit she was before. Our main characters collide, or about to collide. I think one of the things that makes Laura's performance here so special is that this character is so hard and so terrifying, but in every scene where Laura is, is scary, there's also this patina of vulnerability, of fragility that's coming through, where you can feel that she's quaking with rage, but, but there is... There's so much complex stuff happening underneath that rage. It's really great. You're 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 not bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because in the same way I feel about Ashley's performance. <laughs> so there's always this. Just that rage feels so real. She's so good too. Like fucking one shot. And again, from her perspective, it's Jesse's an NPC. Yeah. yeah. He means nothing to her. What is so beautiful here and or tragic is that Ellie doesn't get it. Right? What Ellie's about to say here is like Well, he did it to save me. Um, there's no cure because of me. And Heavy's like, what? It's not it's about not... that. I don't know how much Abby cares about it. It's about her yeah. dad. Like, I showed you mercy. Oh, man, parents were so uncomfortable here. Like, I have to go up against Ellie now. And this is very much by design. Who is scary. She's wily, but you're beefy. <laughs> If I remember correctly, Ashley, we had you, like, have water in your mouth when you delivered some of those the lines here, because your mouth is meant to be filled with blood. Yes. Wow. Okay, because I remember I was, as my, my usual, I was like, why am I just laying here? I would try everything I could to try to get up and go save her. So I think the water and having that and having sort of showing or, or being able to hear how, how messed up Ellie is in that moment. This is the other scene that lives in my head. The knife to a pregnant girl's throat. It's so terrible, but in her mind, like, Ellie just intentionally killed her pregnant friend, and Mel is so visibly pregnant. And the fact that Abby does not kill them shows that she's kind of in a little bit uh, of a better mental place, I think, than Ellie is. Yeah, well, she's, she's grown also a little got her bit. moral compass, like, yes. right in front of her. Yeah. Well, there's, like, yeah. two versions of love right in front of her. One yeah. is a destructive one of, like, wanting to do justice by the people that I've lost, and the other one is wanting to do right by this kid that I've come to be their protector. Hmm. And she Who's chooses. already seen too much violence, who's already experienced too much wrath, right? It's like, he needs peace. Poor baby. Yeah. We, we had a lot of conversations here about um, Ellie's thought process. I, the things she's not expressing, but she put the baby's life at risk right now, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, who knows what, and when she's in this fog of PTSD, what she could have done. This is the moment for Ellie where she's 
It's never gonna get better. It's not gonna get better, and she's put her family in danger. So <laughs> it's probably better to just go. Well, Dina is also trying to sweep it under the rug, and this is what's gonna happen in the next scene. Like, let's just let's just go back to bed. Everything's fine. If I could buy another week, maybe she'll get a little bit better. Or even just the distance to speak. It's just like when somebody's really in the thick of like the panic and the fog of grief like that, it's like you do kind of need time yeah. in order for them to kind of continue to progress through the stages. But it's like Ellie is refusing to move yeah. through these stages. And so like I feel like when we were doing this, like the patience that I have with it was that it's like maybe she'll move to the next stage soon. Maybe we're getting there. Maybe that's what we're getting to. I don't know if we ever talked about this, but we had a whole different version of um, this part of the game where it was Maria that showed up. Yeah, but we felt it would be more intimate if it were seeing seeing how broken uh, Tommy uh, well, was. Well, it should be like feel more the guilt of like seeing the damage on Tommy and having Tommy been changed over this year since he got back to Jackson of like the guy that wanted to protect Ellie and not go on this quest for revenge is now guilting her into it. I like that you're coming in late and you're seeing that this man has been very broken and we're, we're getting a sliver of how the abuse he experienced and the things that he did in Seattle have irreparably damaged him. And he's standing right in front of Ellie and Ellie is looking at how irreparably damaged this man is. And she's like, yep, let's do that to me too. I'm willing to see the ghost of my future. That's the fate I deserve. She did it. On en a beaucoup discuté. C'est ce qu'on voulait tous les deux. <coughs> well, the other thing okay. we were talking about is um, the other big uh, Ellie Tommy scene is after Joel's death and how they can't look at each other. And then this happens again here. Once he asks her to go, she can't look at him. I think it's a confrontation thing, or when I, when I'm feeling anger, but I get uncomfortable. Like I don't want somebody to see it. It's also the shame, right, of the shame of. Yeah. I'm letting you down. I'm letting Joel down. I'm letting myself down. Yeah. I also think that there's something important in the scene for Dina, right? Because Dina has been such an amenable partner through so much of this game and their journey. And even when Ellie's off the deep end, Dina is a nurturing force. And here she's finally drawing the line. She's finally like, we're done with that. I'm speaking for Ellie now. There's a line here, and you're cr you've, you've crossed it. And mm -hmm. like the rage I felt too when he keeps going, I was like, it's insidious. It. You know, it's like he came and brought the virus back into the house, and now she's sick again. Think of all the guilt he's carrying. He failed to save Joel. He failed to save Jesse. He failed to get Abby. He f he's fucked up. His marriage has fallen apart. All he has left now is this revenge. That's it. Well, it also, yeah. it, it, it goes back again to that ego thing where it's like, you asked me to do this and I did it. I went to Seattle. Now I'm coming back for you to pay up and you're going to be a little bitch about it. Well, yeah. it's, uh, and, and again, he doesn't, he's too blind to see the suffering that she's going yeah. through. All he could see is like how damaged, how much, how damaged he is. But what he did say is like, oh, you live out here and like, and you got your family and everything's cushy and everything's fine. And I'm the one suffering, but he doesn't see that. He's, he's not the only one yeah. suffering. And I love, I love that Jeffrey, when Dina walks over and Ellie's sitting there at the table and Jeffrey is not even acknowledging Dina. In a way, Tommy might feel like, I'm more family to you than Dina yeah, is. Yeah, I've yeah, known yeah. you longer. Like, That's exactly what Think of everything felt, what we've yeah. been through. And it's the only time there's really personal conflict between Ellie and Tommy. That's one of my favorite Dina moments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> because it just, it felt so real. I was so mad. Yeah, <laughs> just like flying out the screen door and being like, listen, motherfucker, get off of our property. I love it. So this was one of the first things we shot for this game. Yep. There's so many characters here. We had to shoot this in multiple batches and then stitch it all together. I did several days just dancing. Yes! <laughs> uh, yeah, remember we, we brought a dance choreographer that spent some time with you, Shannon. Yeah. This was the 
demo, and so we had to, this was tricky because we're introducing to the world a lot of new characters with a lot of interesting dynamics and trying to do that through exposition, but as thin an exposition as possible because dear God, nobody likes exposition. It was hard. This scene has jumped around all over the, as we're playing with the structure. It used to be in the very beginning, and then we felt we just had too many cutscenes in the beginning. We need to get to the action a little bit faster, and then we moved it to the end. We changed the writing for the beginning. Bien s'amuser. Um, but there's something kind of nice, and I guess there's, there's a, a, a tragedy to it of um, coming here at the end as a, as a memory of just seeing just Jesse's alive and Ellie and Dina are okay and no one's, and there's Joel. <laughs> and this like really innocent first kiss. Vous couchez pas trop tard, parce que demain, on se lève tôt. À vos ordres. C'est pas sympa. Arrête. This was the first scene we shot. This was the first scene we shot after you hired me. Yeah. Uh, I look at this and I'm just overwhelmed with all the details of the shirt, of sweat stains, of little hairs on the neck, um, little dimples on the smile. And just, this is hundreds of people of work yep. for months mm. to get this little moment. Um, sweat, uh, and, and trying to capture it. The hair that I put behind her ear is crazy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that has to switch from being physics hair to being hand animated hair it's as crazy. soon as you make contact with it. Whoa. And even just the kissing, like, I mean, it's just, <laughs> it, it looks so realistic. Yeah, it's, and, and it it's actually a combination of several performances all stitched together right here. Mm -hmm. and, and then, the lighting has to change from shot to shot. It's interesting highlighting the bracelet that's back on Dina's hand. It's a nice, it's a nice, yeah, it's a, it's a nice reflective it. moment of like how innocent things were for all these characters. Yeah. I love just the little surprise on Ellie's face, the little like moment of shock before melting into it. <laughs> and then we're about to get into Seth. And I get, <laughs> Shannon, the, the, your rage is so real here. <laughs> Hey! There are families here. What the fuck are you looking at? This whole interaction was based on one time I was at, at Blockbuster and I'm standing, I'm just talking to my friend, I'm, I'm throwing curse words around, and the dad in front of me had his two kids, and he's like, Do you mind? There's little kids around. And that always stuck with me. I felt such shame having like used curse words in front of these kids. Hey! 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 Ça suffit. Allez, viens, on va faire un tour. Et eux, alors T'en occupe pas. I feel so bad for Joel here. Ugh, me too. C'est quoi ton problème She doesn't want to be under his shadow anymore. No. And, but he can't help himself. He's just trying to, he's trying someone to is, Someone is hurting her and he's going to stand up for her. Oh, Papa Bear. Yeah, you know you were an asshole. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Saddest scene. Yeah, with the first game, right, we were talking about how um, how do you take this obsession of love, of a parent's love for a child, to the end of the line? And then this has the reverse of it, of like, how do you take hate to the end of the line? Which is also like another um, expression of love. And the engineering of it was that here she has this family that loves her, and it's not good enough because she's letting down Joel in her mind. I love the different um, energies that you both bring to this scene where Dina is giving it her everything in this fight <laughs> and Ellie just has to shut down. This scene, my God. I, I was so hard to leave you because you were so upset and so broken and so sad. And I was like, I, 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 I should my mama stay. I'm sorry. I would argue this is maybe Ellie's darkest moment, even though I know where we're going, because this is the... This is the choice where she forsakes. Yeah, this, is, this is where she makes the choice. Yeah. 
And I think she knows there's a very good chance she's going to die on this journey. I guess the thing that we don't talk about is like, I think she's suicidal. Yeah, I, I think I agree. there's right. There's the guilt of what the should have happened at loud. the hospital. That's why she yeah. leaves with, yeah. in the middle of the night. She's not saying goodbye because it's clearly suicide. Yeah. When the pain gets too loud, she's not there anymore. She's incredibly vulnerable, but she's completely disassociated. And there is this absolute rejection of everything that is right. At that point, like, you know you're not talking to the person that you're in the relationship with. You're talking to the, you're talking to the grief. And so it's like, the convincing comes into like, are you even in there anymore? Mm -hmm. Like, can you, can I just find you for one second? And she's just fully gone. Both characters have very clear goals and then there's an obstacle and then they keep ratcheting out. Like Dina just ups the ante over and over and over until right, the last bit is ultimatum. Even the grabbing of the face. And then like she pulls it's... her hands down. Ugh. And that's it, she knows. Um, philosophically, with this game, what we wanted to do was allow our characters to make immoral choices that the audience would not be on board with. Up until now, like, we shed some of the audience of, like, you know, the Nora torture. Some people have issues with that or certain uh, other kind of violent moments. But here we lose almost everybody. And it's, it is by design in that way of, like, you're now, like, playing this thing that you are not on board with at all. You have to keep going. And in a way, that does align you with Ellie. These shots are so gorgeous. Um, there's a nice misdirect coming up here. We, we, we purposely gave uh, Lev chucks. So you're thinking for a, a second that, oh, okay, this is where I pick up Ellie's journey. And again, now you've been a while away from Abby and Lev. And now Lev has fully shed his seraphite exterior. Has hair. I love to see their growth, their relationship in this moment. Okay, Constance. In letting go of hate, Abby has taken on the Owen's optimism, Owen's hope. Um, this thing that was just this flame that was almost completely extinguished within her. Somehow in all that tragedy and all that horror, she was able to find it again. Her face seems brighter, it seems lighter than it has been the entire game. Even in the flashbacks. <sighs> This is so small, but I love the hope again. It's just like she has a bit of hope here, and then it, it's turned, it's cranked up to 10 when she hears the fireflies on the other side of this radio. And isn't the firefly on the other side of this radio another Vox Machina hero? Is it really? Yeah. Who is it? Liam O'Brien. Is it? Yeah. He was in. He was my fellow nurse, wasn't he? In the. In he the was. Scene? Yeah, we were the two nurse nurses in uh, Last of Us One. Y a quelqu'un sur cette fréquence? Ici, Abby de Santa Barbara. Quelqu'un me reçoit? There's a nice reaction here that Lev has to Abby's again, singular obsession of now finding the fireflies, and he's ready to give up. Quelqu'un me reçoit? À vous. And she keeps going, in desperation. I love artistically how um, the character models for Lev and Yara were kind of a blend of both of the actors' faces because now I'm like looking at baby Lev, but I feel like you can see some spirit of, mm. of Yara still. Y a quelqu'un sur cette fréquence? Allô, ici, Abby de Santa Barbara. Quelqu'un me reçoit? Quelqu'un m'entend, répondez s'il vous plaît. Répondez-moi. Don't give up. Like that, you know, this was perfectly shot, like we're pulling away from her, that this yeah. is how the scene's gonna end. Um. Uh, 24, 25, Constance. On, on nous a parlé de cette base. I, know, I, get, I get weirdly emotional in this scene. Maybe just seeing how happy she is. Étais en poste à quel endroit? J'étais à l'avant-poste de Salt Lake. Like that little head shake. I'm, <laughs> like, I'm, God, I'm so awkward. <laughs> I mean, I guess I'm a firefly. I kind of disavowed them, but. 
That is who I truly am. C'était mon père. Si je m'y attendais, on a vidé tous les avant-postes. Like Liam's acting right here, like in the reply. How about that? Like holy shit. De sang maintenant. Chaque mois, on a de nouvelles recrues. Oui, tu avais raison. Comptez-en deux de plus. Comment on vous rejoint It's a. Oh yeah, that's there. There it is. Dans le grand bâtiment avec un dôme à Avalon. On vous trouvera. Okay. Look at the way Lev looks at her. He's happy for her. On vous attend. Bonne chance. Habite de Santa Barbara. What's also like. There's a possibility of community here again. Yeah. Well, I'm sure everything's going to turn out fine for these two. <laughs> but it needs to, Neil. <laughs> they get ambushed by a new group, the Rattlers. The Rattlers are the worst people we've encountered in the game for um, both practical reasons, uh, which were... We want you to get to see Ellie at her most vicious, most violent. We want her kills to feel brutal and justified. And we want to feel like Abby and Lev, were they not saved, would have died. There's also, um, with this group, wanting to make them really awful, uh, to play a little bit with tropes and structure and misdirect the player, that in a lot of these stories, um, you have these two characters that you're rooting for against each other, and then there's a, a really evil force, and you see them team up, and they're going to work together to defeat the bad guys. And that's how, how this plays out at all. That always felt a little too cliche, and I don't know if it really spoke to the themes of what we're trying to say here. But we wanted the player to think that's what's going to happen. It's a nice economy here of storytelling. Like, you know, we don't show Abby arriving at Santa Barbara with this boat that has become a character of its own in the story. And we're just here with Ellie picking up the tail end of their journey. Um, there's also like a really interesting note here from um, Abby. And it's also the first time we're seeing just how emaciated Ellie has become and she's sunburned and um, clearly not taking care of herself in the pursuit of Abby. I mean, it, it mirrors the, it can't all be for nothing because she's killed so many people at this point. If she stops, that all is just for nothing. I, re I really like that, the parallel of the first game of like, yeah, her wanting to see things all the way through with her stubbornness, even though there's a part of her that says, this is not the right thing to do. Yes. Nice mirror here of the injury that Joel had mm -hmm. in the hospital in the first game. Uh, yeah, we're, we're constructing this. Uh, we wanted to s injure Ellie badly. So again, she's choosing the pursuit of this thing over her own health that she will likely die um, if she sees this all the way through. I would argue she is dead already. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Doing this upside down hair was such a pain. Because um, they have to essentially, you, you can't just move the hair upside down. You have to remodel the whole thing. And we wanted her to have lost so much blood. It's again, the whole thing is starting to feel like a fever dream. And it's, it, it's she thinks she's seeing like Abby and Lev. And then realizes, oh no, it's very different people. Travis and Logic. <laughs> this was um, another moment to show how far Ellie has come and how much how easier it is for her to kill someone in cold blood now versus the earlier parts of the story. And one more instance where she could use her superpower of being immune to get herself out of these jams. And what, actually what she's employing here is very similar to what Nora did to her, which is like try to insult them so they could get reckless, and in that recklessness, she'll find the opening. 
Je crois que t'as chié dans ton froc. C'est que tu I remember in the scene when I take the gun off of Bobby, the strap um, in one of the takes went across his neck and I gave him a really bad rope burn. Oh no! Because I just like yanked it really quickly and he had that for about a week. Oh no! It looked really, I was like, oh no. It looked like he was strangled or something. But he looked badass. He was yeah. so excited. It was, like, it was like, oh my God, Ellie killed me. <laughs> she was yeah. such a fan oh, yeah, of the that's game. Right. He was excited. Um, I, I love how efficient that action is right there. I'm just grabbing the gun, spraying across his legs. And watch this little smirk that you give when he points out your bite. Because he doesn't know you're immune. No one's immune. Travis Willingham. Look at the, your face there. It's like the. It's like she's getting another hit of her drug, of like, I'm actually back on the trail. She's so close, you can feel it. Watch this smile. Looks at the bite, right there. C'est où ça? It's like, had this exchange happened earlier, if she killed someone in cold blood earlier, there'd be a very different reaction. It's like she's becoming more and more like Joel at this point, more and more capable and more and more cold about the violence where she could just execute it and move on and not think twice about it. I think at this point she's completely disassociated from the Ellie like we've ever known. staring him in the eye as he's dying. Just a hint that the injury is getting worse and worse. But again, she's not going to stop. She can't. Not yet. Voie ferrée jusqu'au complexe. Grand bâtiment circulaire. I remember this. Yeah, so the idea, right? She gets hit right at her injury. I like how badass this scene is. The desperation. Ugh. Remember the thumb to the eye. <laughs> this is Matthew Mercer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what I like about this sequence, too, is, like, you can look at everything that Ellie does is so, so ugly and so, so brutal and so, so unnecessary, but had she not come after Abby, who knows if these people would have ever been free, who knows if this uprising would have ever happened, right? So again, there's this, these butterfly wings happening because of all of the choices she's made, that none of them are just black and white. You've got this constant gray you have to reconcile with. Oh, they're staring at her like she's some kind of wild animal. Again, like, there's this whole crazy thing going on here of, like, slaves and slavers, and Ellie cares of none of that. It's just she's so single-minded about Abby, and pretty soon, she, like, in gameplay, she's going to just start repeating Abby, Abby. I wonder how much, how much of Ellie is hoping to die in that fight. C'est toi. how surprising the speed is, right? It's like you keep moving towards this idea of this fight and the whole way you're like Ellie, you're too fucked up. Don't do this. Don't face Abby. We know what she's like and now you come to this absolutely wrecked frail I, I also love um, it's pretty much wordless and you could tell so much with the performance what's going on in their heads and you could see Ellie's confusion and anger and sadness for what she's witnessing yeah it's hard it's like finally the prize is right there and now it just doesn't feel as satisfying I always read that like there are boats this way moment is like if I'm nice to her if I'm just like treat her like not my enemy, then maybe like this will all go by quietly.
to me, this is a really nice mirror beat of, of Joel with Ellie, Joel carrying mm -hmm. Ellie, right? And so you mm -hmm. have that invocation, and Ellie just has to watch it, has to watch this embodiment of somebody who represents every good part of Joel. Mm. Uh, it's, it makes me so sad. This all just, I, the scene, it's just because Ellie doesn't know what to do with all of that anger and that hurt from losing Joel. And now this is the moment. Yeah, because at this point, that's all Ellie has left. It's just this fucked up quest. Yeah, imagine having that image stuck in your head and not knowing how to get rid of it. Yeah. And killing somebody else is not going to do it, but I, 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 you have to get to that point. You have to realize it yourself. Mm -hmm. yeah. This was a hard, this was, this was, we actually had a really fun day. Yeah. As hard as this scene was, and it's so funny doing this with one of your best friends, <laughs> of just like fighting each other, pulling her hair, being like, get you out of here, let's fight. <laughs> Kick me. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think that threat is fake, right? It's, uh, I don't think. Yes, I don't think. She's bluffing. I, I absolutely think she's bluffing. Really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, but I agree, but what would have happened if Abby was like, no. No. Like, I feel like she still would have pushed that. I think she would have pushed that knife in. I, well, that's, I, I mean, this that's is a, great that there's all these different interpretations. That's so I, cool. I don't, I don't think she would. There were all these other versions of how Ellie lost her fingers. You remember, Hallie, of like, there used to be when someone was waiting for her at the farm and then tortured her in retribution for what happened oh, in Seattle. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. So, yeah, so, it was like the it was like the parent or somebody yeah. of of somebody who died, of like an NPC essentially, who came. And so you're seeing that cyclical nature of violence of like you killed my person, you killed my person, you killed my person. So somebody you didn't even realize you'd really killed tracks Ellie down. Wow. I love how you pin her with your knee. Yeah. So originally, the conception was that Abby dies here. And it would have been such a different game, I think, if yeah. Yeah. if right now there was just a body underwater and Ellie was having this moment. Yeah, you didn't know that? I did not know Abby died here originally. Well, well yeah, originally, like I think both Yara and Lev died. And this was just Abby by herself when you meet up with her. Oh. And then Ellie kills Abby. Prof. Yeah. I think leaving Ellie with 3% of the humanity that she got from who she was, that good kid, that scrappy kid that Joel helped shape, I think if she killed Abby, you would never see that kid again. Mm -hmm. And this gives a hope that she's still in there a little bit and could be maybe revived in the same way that Abby was revived in the right circumstance. Mm. I agree seeing the reactions, there's people that wanting to know, what was it exactly that made Ellie stop? Is it Lev? Is it this memory of Joel? Is it everything she's experienced? Is it just like Abby's state, that it's not this person that defeated her in the theater? And to me, it's all those things. The way our brains work is so messy. And that's, the, the story is, was always meant to be very messy in that way, that there aren't these clear cut answers. To me, that, that moment is, two more seconds, this girl is dead. So I already know what this feels like. I can see what I'm gonna feel like five seconds from now. Yes. And it's no different. Yes. So why? Originally, the house was fully empty. And there was a concern, I think, that we had that it's going to feel like something bad happened mm. to Dina, and we don't want to make it feel like it's... Right. That's the, th the thought in her head. It's more Dina has made the choice to move back. 
she had to move back too. She couldn't stay there alone with a baby. It was too dangerous. But I do think there's something poetic in like she didn't take Ellie's things with her. She, yeah. There wasn't a I'm waiting for I'm you. Waiting I'm going to build behind. her home. It's it's I'm letting this Let I'm letting go. this die. Yeah, here, and I'm going to let everything rot for you. <laughs> well, that's really bleak. Yeah, we wanted to create a metaphor for the unintended consequences of pursuing justice at any cost. And um, here we get the feel it of the song that means so much to Ellie, she just can't play it anymore. Also interesting thinking about Joel's headspace right now, like just been humiliated by Ellie in front of everyone. Mm. Who knows what's going through his head, but for me, sometimes when I get just filled with anxiety, it's, it's guitar. It's just sitting down and just jamming and just... Yeah, not even playing like, a song, just playing through something. Uh, and we've had this scene at different spots of the game until, until we finally landed that it's, it's this final moment. Yeah, I think originally we were going to put it before the midpoint showdown of the game. Right. Mm. Oh, it plays so much better at the end. Yeah, no, it does. It, now you can't imagine it anywhere else once, yeah. it's, once it's here. Tu bois quoi? Traded his soul for coffee. Hmm. T'en as trouvé où? Euh, les gens qui sont passés la semaine dernière. I would do the same. This is um, the most Ashley has ever pushed back on a scene. <laughs> Wait, uh, really? Which, this was because um, originally it was written that they hug at the end of the scene. And you're like, I don't know if they would. Mm. I'm not sure like they, we could it. get all the way there. You were sport about it. And we did uh, two versions, one with a hug, one without a hug. And they were both very, very good. But ultimately, you were right. They're starting to forgive each other, but they're not fully there. Ultimately makes it more tragic. Yeah, I think that's why she goes on this journey, because it's just like it was never solved. Mm. Our relationship was never fixed. Dina, vous êtes ensemble. No. No, c'était juste un baiser. Ça veut rien dire, elle voulait juste... Je sais pas ce qu'elle voulait. Mais elle te plaît. They just have like a father-daughter moment. Just this yeah. exchange about this crush that she has on this other girl and, and Joel telling her like she would be lucky to have you. Again, it just he has unconditional love for the for for Ellie. And that's what t drives her mad. It'd be so much easier if he was if just he a was complete just... piece of shit. Oh, yeah. And you could just forget about him. Yeah. But you can't. I mean, that's what's hard. I mean, she she knows that he cares. And she knows that he does love her. <laughs> I also love that you bring it back to we're talking around the thing that we need to talk about. And you doing all of these gestures to try to make it better is not what I want. I'm going to bring it back to what the issue is, and that's I should have died in that hospital. I, I also love watching um, when do you both decide to make eye contact? Mm. <laughs> oh, right, interesting. I just, and it's like right here for a watch at the end of this statement for emphasis. All eye contact. Because <laughs> I am dead serious. I don't care the cost. I would do it all over again. Even if it means I'd lose you. There is something to be said for your writing in this, which is I would do it all over again, and I would do it all over again. Walk the knife's edge of meaning. Because there's one that is repentant, and there is one that is resolute. No, Pesh. I like this, this false moment. I can never forgive you for that. And he's, and he's ready to accept it. And then he's all of a sudden, but I'd like to try. And then I think the water works for everyone. Yeah. Just start right here. Oh. We did a lot of work of just writing these scenes and not being heavy handed to talk about theme. 
but there is something about just the placement of the scene here. And it's a scene about getting over some horrible transgression that one feels because there's other things that are worthwhile in this world than just kind of living in this resentment next to the moment where Ellie decides to let Abby go. And whether she fully forgives her or not almost doesn't even matter. It's just she knows there's other things in life that are more worth putting your focus on. It's, it's interesting read, like, uh, seeing since the game has come out, it's been out for a few years now, um, how many different interpretations there are for this leaving of the guitar here. Whether it's she's fully forgiven Joel or whether she's fully forgiven Abby or whether she's willing to move on or whether she just doesn't want to be in, under Joel's shadows anymore. And when people always like, I don't know if you get this often, people often come to me and they want the answer. They're like, which one is it? Mm -hmm. And I'm like... It's all those things. It's all those things in some way. Like, people's minds are so complicated. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's what we've been talking about with grief and how that can sort of manifest in somebody. I'll, I'll caveat by saying this is my own interpretation. It doesn't mean that it's right. It's just mine. Um, but sometimes you have so many triggers of for trauma that you just need to let anything that might trigger you, you just have to let it go and start over. I mean, how I felt in that moment of... It's easier just to not get close to people. We you know when we were writing this, we, we had so many conversations about leaving it on, on a hopeful note. And even though it's very dark, I do find it to be a, a hopeful note. It's left with that question of like, once you've committed all these atrocities yourself, can you come back from that? And we saw that Joel was able to, and then maybe Ellie could as well. I remember when you guys told me that that was going to happen, and I was very nervous man what a journey it's a long game it's a long game i'm curious how do you interpret her leaving the guitar behind ashley because she could have taken it with her she could learn to play left-handed i think that so much of it is ugh. I feel like it's a lot of things. I feel like some of it is... <laughs> Deserving is not the word that I'm looking for, but I feel like there's a part of Ellie that's like, you know what, this is part of a life that I had that I now have to kind of leave behind because of the choices that I've made and the things that I did. And I think it's gonna be easier if I just leave it all and not have to not have to go back and try to visit it every day and i think also having the if she did take the guitar with her that would be a constant reminder mm. of joel like it would be triggering it would be triggering in a way and i think you know if ellie had therapy in this world um it, it probably would have ended differently. But as someone who knows, <laughs> like when you go through stuff and you just kind of like trash compactor it down into your body and not deal with it, um, I think that's kind of where she's at. But kind of just like if I leave it all behind, this is what I kind of deserve. Do you think if she leaves the guitar behind, she's hoping that she will no longer have the... Yeah, I think there's a little bit of that there of like, maybe if I don't have this reminder, I'll get over it. Because trying to find revenge and retribution, that didn't, that didn't fill that hole. What do you think it is? What do you guys think it is when you were thinking of leaving the guitar there? And specifically because cutting off the fingers was a very strong choice to not be able to play the guitar and have that connection anymore. Sometimes it's hard to kind of um, reverse engineer what was the inspiration or the process, but uh, I find playing guitar so therapeutic. Um, and it, I associate music with specific times in my life and memories that to then if someone were to take that away from me, and especially if I were responsible for the reason it's taken away from me, then it might be too hard to just constantly play it badly or um, especially this particular guitar that's gifted to her by Joel 
and right, her memories with Joel are, I think, mostly positive, but it's mixed with some negative stuff and the journey of the first game. And this is a point where I think she wants to start over, that she came to the brink of being a, a villain. Uh, and she's, I mean, in some ways she was, and she probably killed many people on this journey that might not have deserved that fate. But I think now she wants to go on a journey to reflect on that and find a different purpose. I'm curious, uh, maybe Ashley and then Laura, like how do you feel years later now, people had very strong reactions to this game, both positive and negative, and how do you feel about it? There's so, I, I feel like I have so many feelings about it. I feel like now having some years behind us of the game being out. Um, I love this game so much, and I think I, I think it's such a, a beautiful piece of media because of the story and the narrative and what it has to say, and that's so much to Hallie and Neil. Um, I think the aftermath, when it first came out, seeing what Laura had to deal with, my friend, and you guys, and all of us, of something that we cared about so much, and in the process of five years of making this and all of the hands that touched it. And there was a period that was rough because you're getting this judgment from people who, who don't fully know the story and are it was hard. It was it was rough. It was rough. Yeah. I think there was a lot of, of after two of, of people. <laughs> but I don't feel like when we were playing the game that, yeah, Ellie is making some really strong decisions. <laughs> <laughs> but it's funny, a lot of people would come up and be like, dude, Ellie's like a murderer. What happened to her? She's and I'm like, no, she's just she's got some some stuff. <laughs> um but even still, like, now having, you know, coming out of that time of, of, I feel like that was one of the first times where I've sort of dealt with, like, a reaction like that. Uh-huh. And it sucks. It hurts. Especially if you love something so much. Yeah. And all the time that everybody put into it. And it sucked seeing my friend get attacked and things that all of you guys of, of things that I care about, but I know that's so much of the world we live in, but I think it was just like a, a perfect storm of, of timing too. And, yeah. and because everybody was so separated, um, we were all dealing with that separately. Right. Mm. Um, yes. We didn't get to see each other and like talk it through. Right. We, uh, and it's crazy because for so long, and I've, I've talked to you about this, like, there was no closure mm. yeah. for the game. You know, normally, yeah. you, like, you rap, and we have, like, a rap party, and we get to, like, see everybody and, and kind of, like, rejoice in what we made and, like, how much of our hearts we poured into something. Right. Yeah. And we never got the celebration mm -hmm. yeah. of finishing it and seeing it released to the world. Um, and all we got instead was, like, that that vitriol like thrown Ugh. so it was rough but it's you know again it's been years and I'm I'm so just proud and it is it's a it's it's a story that if you if you play it I don't see how it can't change you yeah you know it it changes how you view violence it changed how I Played games, you know, like as I was playing the game, I found myself I wasn't attacking people anymore. Like I started, <laughs> like I I love to just destroy every person that I come across. Like it's a completion thing for me. And as I'm playing, <laughs> I was like, I I stealthed everywhere. Instead, yeah. I didn't want to hurt anyone anymore. Yeah. I remember when we started doing press uh, at the end of the game, toward the end of the game, people would be like, Oh my god! And all the dogs, you have to kill all the dogs. And I remember being like. You don't actually have to kill any of the dogs but Alice. So that's on you. <laughs> and people like having to own that reality, right? Like yeah. you you have to face your own ugliness in the game. And I think I, I hope I I hope 
I think the game will age well. I think the game will, the story and, and the mechanics and the beauty of the world will hold up over time as an incredibly complex piece of storytelling in and of itself, outside of like its own medium. Yeah. I hope, but yeah, that was a rough time. Well, I, I remember, right, so it's months before the game comes out. We have to delay it indefinitely. Yeah. There's mm -hmm. a backlash from our most hardcore fans. And people just waiting in the wings to attack Naughty Dog yeah. because we're woke and diverse and all these woke, other reasons. Woke, diverse, taking too long to get a game out. Um, <laughs> so we're And we're all at home and we're all going to have to be depressed at home as this is happening and finish the game. Yeah. And then the game comes out and it goes on a little bit of a redemption arc because it wins all these awards. And I've never, I don't know if I've ever talked about this or was, maybe I was afraid to like talk to you all about this. But um, my greatest fear when that backlash was happening was that I've let you all down in some way, that I didn't do right by you. Uh, and that's why I've always been afraid to kind of talk about it with you because I feel like I would get really emotional. Uh, I remember talking with Troy about it because I'm like, dude, I, I apologize to him. I'm like, I feel like I did you wrong. And now you're like, and he's like, no, what are you talking about? Like, I love this thing. Like, I wouldn't change a, a beat. But, you know, we all had our share of all sorts of things that were really awful to deal with at the time. And when people ask me, like, was it worth it? Was it worth doing this whole thing? And when I think about myself, I say, yes, I would do it again in a heartbeat. I, like, I'm so proud of this thing. When I think about what you all went through, that's the one thing that gives me pause. That especially you, Laura, what you went through. That's when I'm like, I don't know if I would put an actor through that again. Um, and it sucks that that's kind of the world that we oh, live man. in. But I, I, I just care about you so much that I just, I felt terrible for what you were going through. Well, we, 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 were, well, we were all going through it, so. <laughs> but, but then, you know, when you started winning all those awards, I was like, I hope, and again, I, 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 was, I was so afraid to talk to you about it. I'm like, I hope that's some sort of vindication. Oh my I gosh, hope. Yeah. yeah. Yes, and, you know, like I said, I think it's just, just time, right? Yeah. yeah. It, when it first happened, it was, it was not a good time. No. But, God, I forgot But I mean, I'm was... still like, oh, oh. But I, I, I the, love it. I, I do love it. And, you know, there, there's some people that just hate the game and hate us for it. Sure. And there's way more that love it. And some people say it's their greatest story of experience out of any media. And some people say it's the worst story of experience <laughs> yeah. out of any media. But the interesting thing to me about it is, like, this game is so much about tribalism and saying I'm right and you're wrong. Yeah. And losing the mm. nuance of that conversation. And so much of the conversation, years later now, people are still arguing about it on that level and not seeing the irony that they're kind of proving the point of the story, the way they're arguing about it, about whether Joel was right or Abby was right. or Ellie. And it's like, no one was right, no one was wrong. <laughs> it's just messy and gross in the way that these conflicts usually are. Yeah. yeah. I feel like looking back on this, it's so funny, because I, I think when, when all of the backlash was coming out I had a similar feeling like you did which I think I told you where I was like it's my fault what I <laughs> fucked what? it up what are you talking about <laughs> well it's just it it's such a like uh, I don't know I I I, I think I don't know. I mean, it's probably the same thing that you felt, where you're just like, okay, cool. I, I, when it really just doesn't have anything to do with you, it's a lot of people, like Laura was saying, a lot of the frustrations that people were having and the timing that we were in. But when I think back on this game, I love both games so much, but I feel like the story and... I don't want to say the message of the game because it's like there's so much to say. I'm so proud of what we all made. And I think as I get older, I'm, I still feel like this is going to be something that I hold so dear because of something that we were able to accomplish and the story that we were able to tell, especially in a video game. And that it's a bunch of, I mean, badass women that are, are taking on this world, and it's a perspective that you don't see a lot, especially in video games. And as hard as that time was, I'm so proud that we got to be a part of it, that I got to be a part of it. Yeah. I regret every moment. <laughs> it's the worst thing I've ever done. <laughs> uh... 
I guess maybe to, to wrap it up here, uh, it's a joy. It's been awesome working with you both. I can't wait to do it again on whatever project we might do in the future, but um, there's a reason that uh, I keep coming back to working with the same people over and over again, because one, you, you try to find talent, but maybe even more important than that is you want to enjoy the people you work with. And despite, you know, the, how, uh, uh, you know, we landed the plane, even if the, the, the landing was a bit rough with what happened there at the end. Um, again, just looking at myself, not for everything you've experienced, I would easily do it all over again. Same. Same. I don't know. <laughs> well, you're out. <laughs> well, I left. I would do it. I would do it all again, but I would not have a Twitter account. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's so. That's, that's the final the lesson of Last of Us Part Two, yes. which is get off uh, social media. Get off of social media. <laughs> well, after several hours with us, this is the end of our commentary. Thank you for hanging in there. I hope you got some insight into our process. As you can tell, we're very proud of this game. Until next time, endure and survive. I'm going there to see my savior. I'm going there no more to roam. I'm just a groom. Over Jordan, I'm just a going over home. I'm just a going over Jordan. I'm just a going.